Okay, very good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome to uh, another um, HSMA uh, training day. Um, uh, just to say my apologies in advance if my uh, uh, there seem to be a, an extraordinary amount of packages arriving uh, at, the, at this house uh, today. Hopefully they will be during the uh, uh, the time you undertake the exercise. But um, if my doorbell rings, I'm going to have to run. So uh, apologies. So do excuse me uh, for two minutes if that if that does happen. But hopefully we'll be fine. Um, OK, so um, today uh, we are um, going to be looking at a couple of different things. Um, uh, this morning, we're going to be finishing off um, our journey through uh, natural language processing. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of the module last week, um, this is really just to give you a few sort of practical hands on uh, things that you can do uh, in natural language processing. This is a huge area. Um, and uh, if you're potentially interested in, in looking at natural language processing, the, there's a lot more out there that you can look at. But we focus the, the training here uh, in the HSMA programme around some sort of simple practical uh, stuff um, that you can do. So we're going to look at uh, sentiment analysis this morning. Um, and then this afternoon, we're going to start on the uh, behavioural modelling um, module um with uh with cellular automata and we'll talk more about that uh later um but yeah this morning so last week we we introduced um natural language processing um as a means of uh trying to uh, automate the extraction um of information from uh free text uh, unstructured text data um which is obviously hugely useful um for uh, a lot of uh, a lot of applications because um, we have a lot of uh, free text, unstructured text data um, that, that is collected. Um, and so if we can do something about automating the process of extracting certain pieces of information from that, um, then that helps us a great deal. So last week, we primarily focused on uh, one of those things, which was um, uh, named entity recognition. So looking to see if we can automatically extract um, named entities, uh, um, things that have uh, physical or abstract existence that have a proper name and can be denoted using a proper name, um, because those are things that we can potentially uh, want to extract from uh, from free text data. Um, but this uh, this week, this morning, we're going to look at um, uh, another really uh, popular um, application of natural language processing. Um, uh, and that's sentiment analysis. Can we uh, automatically identify um, the tone of a uh, piece of text, which can be uh, hugely useful, um, particularly if we're gathering um, unstructured text data um, from things like surveys, um, et cetera, as well. So let's, uh, let's start. So um, a little uh, important notice, hopefully you've all done this. Um, but if you haven't, just be aware that this uh, it's, I mean, it's not a massive download, but you will need to do this um, for the exercise today, that you have to have downloaded the uh, large uh, movie review uh, data set, um, which is available here. Basically, this is um, uh, a big data set that contains uh, 50,000 uh, movie reviews uh, from the Internet Movie uh, Database. Um, and we're going to use that. Um, so, And they've all been classified into positive reviews, negative reviews. Um, and we're going to use that today um, in order to train a model uh, to be able to pick up sentiment um, and then see if we can apply it to, to other things as well. Um, the other important notice, which hopefully you did if you've downloaded this, and if you haven't uh, uh, done it, you will need to do it before you attempt the exercise, once you, this has been downloaded and, and extracted, you have to extract it to the same directory as wherever you've stored your um, .py files for this session. You must remove, there's a, there's a subfolder in the train directory called unsup. You must delete that or at least move it somewhere else. Um, uh, but I, I would just delete it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna need it. Um, basically, this is a this is a folder um, that's used for um, unsupervised learning, which we're not gonna we're not gonna cover. Um, if you leave it in, um, the uh, the uh, method that we use to automatically pull out the text files will also pull in all these text files, and it will massively a it will massively slow down your training. You'll be watching it trickle along. Um, the, but the bigger problem is that you'll get terrible performance from your model because it's trying to pick up all this stuff that isn't relevant as well. So do make sure you delete that. Otherwise, you will uh, run into problems. Um, I used to forget to notify people to do that every year, hence why uh, this slide uh, is now uh, included. 
Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about sentiment analysis uh, last week when we introduced um, natural language processing. So sentiment analysis basically uses AI-based methods, um, and we're trying to automate the extraction of information, much as with other natural language processing methods. But here, the information we are trying to extract is the sentiment or tone um, that the author intended uh, when uh, they wrote a piece of text, um, primarily to identify whether it's um, positive or negative. Sometimes we we look at it uh, in terms of being positive, negative or neutral. We're not going to look at that um, today. We're just going to look at classifying positive or negative. We will talk a little bit uh, um, uh, later this morning about um, something called aspect level sentiment analysis, which I think is a better approach for the kind of applications you will be doing um, if you need to look at uh, mixed sentiment. Um, but we'll talk more about that later. So basically, uh, we talked last week about how the way in which Spacey works. Um, so Spacey, uh, to do named entity recognition and um, pulse tagging and noun chunking and all that kind of stuff that you looked at last week. Spacey, uh, remember, uses um, kind of AI-based methods um, specifically uses transformer-based methods now, but um, it's trying to basically predict whether a group uh, of words or a word is a named entity or is a noun in this context, or this re this group of words represents a, a noun phrase. It's making predictions um, based on an AI algorithm. Here, um, with sentiment analysis, what we're doing is we're trying to predict whether a piece of text is positive which is usually a class one, or negative, uh, uh, which we usually denote with a class zero. Um, if we do, which we won't do today, but if we um, if we did want to look at whether something is neutral, then we tend to have three classes with positive being one, negative being minus one, and neutral sitting in the middle at zero. Um, but don't worry about that. We're just going to look at a binary classification model today, um, looking at positive or um, negative uh, sentiment. It's also worth saying as well that, that um, the approach that we're using here is much in the same way that you would uh, approach any machine learning. You're essentially trying to say, given this bundle of stuff, this bundle of features, our inputs, uh, it, it represents, I want you to learn that it represents this classification. So in the Titanic data, this bundle of values means they're likely to survive, whereas this bundle of values means that they're likely to die. Uh, what we're doing here with sentiment analysis is basically saying this bundle of values, i.e. this bunch of words put together in this way, uh, means they are talking positively, whereas this bunch of words means they are talking negatively. So it's the same principle. And in fact, you'll see uh, this morning that it uses exactly the same principle that we used in the neural network session um, with uh, some slight differences. So one of the differences is that um, uh, the... Uh, the methods I'll show you to construct the neural network are very, very slightly different. Uh, that's just because you can do things in multiple ways, uh, and because I took this from the um, uh, uh, from the official TensorFlow uh, tutorial, and they do it very slightly differently. But you'll see the same principle: you're adding layers and compiling it, and adding an optimizer. All that stuff is just the, the, the syntax we're using today is slightly different. They're interchangeable. You can equally use the stuff we did before. Um, but the key difference, uh, and the most fundamental difference, when we're doing natural language processing uh, based AI, um, we have to turn our uh, text data into numbers. Okay, and we'll talk more about that this morning. Um, and we saw a glimpse of that um, before uh, when we talked about machine learning. We said that we can't have, we need numbers fundamentally because a neural network has to deal with numbers, as do computers at a fundamental level. Um, so we have to turn everything to numbers. So we had various um, different types of columns in the Titanic data. Some were numbers already, um, where, but some were kind of classifications where, you know, where they embarked on the Titanic. Um, and we'd one hot encode those so that we, we, we'd we say, well, they either embarked here, here or here. But where we're dealing with natural language data, which is pure text, um, then we have to do things a bit differently because actually um, that text data needs to in some way uh, turn into a number. And we, we use a process called vectorization to, to do that. Uh, and we'll talk more about that this morning. So why might you care about um, sentiment analysis? Well, potential applications, a uh, big one here, I think, um, trying to automatically classify um, service user survey data. If you've taken surveys, if those surveys contain unstructured data, 
um, unstructured text, free text, where they can write whatever they like. Most surveys will contain at least an element of that. Um, then you can use these methods to try and automatically um, identify uh, whether people are talking positively or, or negatively. Um, you can have uh, um, use it to analyze reviews of things like movies, which you'll look at this morning, and uh, books, anything like that. Um, analyzing social media posts, uh, uh, things on Twitter, for example, that people have posted um, positively and negatively um, these days, unfortunately, largely negatively, but um, uh, but we can use that. And indeed, uh, I mentioned last week looking at, um, uh, I'd suggest having a look at Mike Hill's presentation from uh, HSMA3, um, which uh, focused on uh, basically building a tool that will automatically identify the sentiment of tweets to every police force in the country. Um, and also you can use it to look for um, uh, positive or negative references to your organization on, on the internet to be more proactive about reaching out to, to users. So we talked a little bit about the overall process. We skimmed over this um, last week, uh, but we're gonna talk about this in detail now this morning. Uh, so when we're uh, conducting sentiment analysis, basically this is the general process that you will go through. Uh, the first thing, and some of this, is identical to what we would do for any machine learning, but some of it is unique to um, uh, natural language processing uh, or sentiment analysis specifically in this case. So uh, first thing we need to do, we need to load in the raw text data, okay? Then we need to clean up that data uh, in some way. And um, we'll talk more about that. We touched on a little bit of that last week when we looked at word clouds, um, but we'll show you some different ways to do that um, this week. And um, then, Crucially, we need to convert uh, our cleaned up text into numbers because the neural network will need them uh, as numbers. Then we're going to convert it into a format usable by a neural network. That's basically the, those uh, those tensors, those blobs of stuff that, that we chuck through our neural network. We need to convert it into that format. Then we build our neural network and, and uh, compile it as well. I should say build and compile, really. Then we train our neural network and then we use our trained neural network to try and predict new data. So much of this is similar, you know, with any machine learning, you would load in the data, pre-process it in some way, convert it into a tensor, build and compile your network, then train the network, fit the network, uh, and then use that network to try and uh, have a look at predictions for unseen data. Um, but the crucial difference is this bit here where we, we're converting um, that, uh, uh, that clean text, the pre-process, data into uh, numbers because none of it will be numbers in, in our case here. Okay, so let's start with the first step, cleaning the data. Um, so uh, with uh, a standard kind of machine learning problem, um, pre-processing the data and cleaning up the data usually means things like, um, you know, making sure the data is in the right format, putting it into um, a pandas data frame, um, uh, dealing with missing values because you can't have missing values, so working out what you're going to do with those kind of things. All the kind of stuff that's in uh, Mike's Titanic uh, um, uh, uh, materials in the pre-processing, all that kind of stuff, we do that normally. Um, but with natural language processing, we need to do things because we're dealing with text data, um, it's a little bit different. So um, specifically, because we're looking at sentiment analysis, there are certain things that we will want to do that we didn't do when we did named entity recognition. Um, because in named entity recognition, uh, actually the, the raw text can give clues as to what might be a named entity. And linking words like and and the might be important in helping it make a prediction about what a, where the named entities are. But if we're trying to... Um, uh, work out the sentiment, the tone of a piece of text. We're looking for key words, key clues in there. We're less worried about the syntax uh, of the of the text, the way in which it's it's structured. That tends to be less helpful for us um, to try to understand what the the sentiment, the intended sentiment of the author uh, was. Um, so there's there's a few things that we need to do typically um, to our text uh, data before we uh, look to analyze uh, sentiment from it. So here are some common things. There's actually, um, you'll see in the example we used this morning, because we're using data from the internet, there's an additional step that we do before this, because uh, um, data from the internet will have um, hypertext markup, uh, HTML, um, and so uh, we need to do stuff to get rid of that sometimes as well. But um, uh, if you're just using uh, data from surveys, et cetera, you, unless they've been done online, you, you probably won't have that. 
Um, but we will we will show you how to do that this morning. So uh, first thing we need to do, we need to convert everything uh, into uh, lowercase. We mentioned this a little bit last week uh, when we dealt with word clouds. Similar thing here. We don't care if a user wrote the word uh, rubbish with a capital R or uh, rubbish with a lowercase R or even uh, put capital letters in the middle of the, the word. It doesn't matter. We're interested that they've used the word rubbish. We don't care. And remember, Python, as with any programming language, treats strings as lists of characters. That's what they are. Um, and so uh, this string here, rubbish with a capital R, is different to this string with a lowercase r. Um, so we, we don't want that. So we tend to just convert everything to lowercase. We're not interested in case for sentiment analysis. So we'll just convert everything to lowercase. So the same word, if they've used the word rubbish, uh, then they we, we, we consider that um, uh, to be the same regardless of how they capitalize things. We also need to tokenize the text. We touched on that last week when we did um, uh, the word cloud analysis. Um, remember, tokenization is where you're breaking down text into um, various different elements. Usually, uh, that's breaking it down into individual words. It doesn't have to be. Normally, that's what we mean by tokenization. Um, we also need to remove um, punctuation because that's not going to help us. Um, and optionally numbers as well. Sometimes numbers can help, but um, uh, very often they won't. Uh, so we tend to remove those things. We'll actually leave in numbers um, for the um, uh, for the example we see this morning um, as well. Um, we are going to stem words. So um, we, we're basically trying to find words with common stems and treat them all as the same word. So the words watching, watch, and watched all have the same stem, uh, and we want to treat them all the same way semantically, um, because actually those things all kind of mean the same thing. They're, they're different tenses of the verb, but they all semantically mean the same thing. So very often uh, we will stem words as well. Again, in the example this morning, uh, we won't go through that step, but um, uh, uh, the, in some sentiment analysis, you will see this, this, this step being done. And it can help because it can uh, simplify your data and therefore your model. Um, and therefore um, you might get improved learning by doing that. Um, we're also gonna remove stop words. We are gonna do that this morning, um, such as uh, a, the, and those kind of things. Again, we mentioned them last week. We're not typically interested in them for word clouds and we're not interested in them for sentiment analysis. Those words, those kind of linking words don't really tell us much about the sentiment of a piece of text. They're really important for name identity recognition because we're looking at structure and trying to predict where things might sit within a structure, but they're they're pretty much useless for this. So we'll remove those. So once we've cleaned up our text, we're going to convert our uh, cleaned up text uh, into numbers uh, so that each of our words is represented as a number. Um, and this is because, as I say, neural networks have to deal with numbers. They are, remember, uh, uh, performing weighted sums and then chucking them out to an activation function, which converts that number in some way. So they're dealing with numbers. It's numbers that we're chucking through. So we need some way in which we can conver convert our words into numbers that is meaningful, um, that still uh, captures um, the, the underlying text data so that we can then feed that through uh, the neural network such that if we chuck through this combination of numbers, which represents uh, this combination of words, then uh, we get either a one or a zero classification. So it's positive or negative. So the way there's different ways you can do it. Um, the way we're going to do it here, and it's a common uh, approach for this, uh, is we represent words according to the inverse of their frequency uh, in the text. So the most frequent word will have a number of one. So that gets the, that gets turned into the number one. The reason we do that is that allows us to really easily chop out uncommon words. Uncommon words are not going to be helpful to us because they're not used very often and they're not going to help us learn. Um, uh, we're interested in the more common words, um, and so we can we can chop out um, uh, 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 basically say we only want the five thousand most common words used. The ten thousand most. Uh, commonly words uh, um, words used. Um, and uh, by taking the inverse frequency, so I'm just looking because there's a van pulled up, so I may have to run in a second. 
that's driven off. Okay. Um, so by taking the inverse frequency, um, basically, we, it allows us to very easily do that. If we say we only want the top 10,000 words, then we can get rid of the, you know anything above 10,000 in terms of our uh, words, because they're now represented as numbers. So that makes it really easy for us to uh, very easily uh, do that and also to uh, change it uh, as well. So that's quite an easy way in all, uh, for us to convert text data into numbers while still uh, retaining the importance of the sort of the underlying importance of the uh, the words uh, within within that data. Uh, we also need to, once we've done that, uh, remember we need to convert it into uh, the format, the the, the blob um, uh, that's needed to push it through a neural network. That's a tensor. Remember. Also remember, don't worry too much about uh, what a tensor is. It's just a, it's quite a complex uh, concept, but it's the it's the shape that we need our our our, our, our numerical data to be in uh, in order to be fed through our, our multi-dimensional neural network. Um, and basically, uh, this involves separating our, our data into uh, inputs, which remember in this case, so that's our features. In this case, that's our sequence of words um, as numbers that make up each bit of text that we want to uh, that we want to classify, and our labels, our outputs, which is a, a one or a zero indicating whether um, each input is uh, positive or negative. So, it's the same principle that we had before that we've got a bundle of inputs, our features, um, and we've got an output, an output label. Um, it's just that the inputs here are sequences of words, except they'll be sequences of words as numbers uh, rather than the raw words themselves. And our labels are, as before, a one or a zero, depending on what the, the, the classification is for a binary classification problem. Um, we also need, uh, with this kind of data, we need all of the inputs um, to be the same size. So with the neural network, everything has to be the same shape when you feed it through. So what we do is we decide on a size. Now, in, in this case, the size represents the number of words um, that we are representing in our data. So if you're thinking of, uh, for example, pushing through um, reviews from uh, 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 of films or things that people have written um, in a particular box on your survey, we decide on a size that we will push through and everything has to be that size. Now, obviously in the real world, people write things at, at different lengths, but we can't deal with that in a neural network. We have to have everything the same size. So what we do is we decide on, an, on, on a, a, a standard size. Anything shorter than that, we pad out using a special value of, of zero, which the neural network basically ignores. Anything longer than that gets chopped off. Okay, so we may say, okay, we, we're only going to look at um, a size of, uh, everything's going to be size 300 words. Uh, remember, it won't be 300 words as written because we'll have gotten uh, gotten rid of stop words and things like that. Um, so it'll be 300 words once all of that's been taken out. Um, but what we will do is we'll say ev everything is 300 words. So anything shorter than that will pad out. So there'll be a load of zeros representing uh, the uh, a padding word, a pad word, we call it, um, uh, going from the end of the uh, that sequence of text to uh, to whatever however many words we've said uh, anything above that we will chop off uh, and we also need to as we do for any machine learning problem we need to split the data that we've got into uh, training um, uh, and test sets we're actually going to split into uh, do a train validation test split uh, today um, which you haven't yet seen before we've talked about it um, but we're we're going to do that uh, for this particular example. Um, and remember, this extra validation set is like a little bonus test set that we can use to try and give us an indication of how things are working um, and then use the test set as kind of the final check. Um, and we can monitor the how well it's performing on the validation set in each epoch, in each training time unit, um, and see how that changes. And that can help us identify things like uh, overfitting, for example. And you'll see an example of that this morning. Uh, so building and training the neural network, 
this is um, the same as we went through in module seven. We're building the neural network up one layer at a time, uh, although we'll do it slightly differently this morning. Um, and then we compile the network uh, to assemble it. And we specify the optimizer and the loss function and, and all that stuff. The same sort of stuff you've seen before. Then once we've done that, uh, we're going to specify how many epochs our learning time units we want the neural network to go through. Um, and the batch size, remember, we don't chuck through all of the data we've got at once. We split it up into batches because it helps the um, uh, helps the neural network to learn and not to overfit. Um, and it helps to learn the, the, the kind of nuances of the data. So we split it into batch sizes. We chop off our data and chuck it through a batch at a time. Uh, and once all of the batches have gone through, that represents one epoch. Uh, once we've done that, we start the model training. We fit the model. Remember, model fitting is model training in neural network terms. And uh, then we output metrics, uh, things like accuracy, et cetera, so we can monitor how well uh, the, uh, the the machine is, the neural network is learning um, and look out for things like um, overfitting, which obviously we've talked about. Okay. So there's a piece of code that um, we're going to look at uh, together and you're going to look at um, in the exercise in a moment um, uh, this morning, which is basically going to build a neural network. Um, it's going to uh, uh, try, uh, in order to try and identify um, the sentiment uh, of uh, piece, uh, pieces of text, and it's going to train on movie reviews, 50,000 movie reviews, uh, 25,000 of which are positive, 25,000 of which are negative that have been taken from the internet movie uh, database. We're going to use TensorFlow as we did for um, module seven, and we're going to use the Keras API, which sits on top of Keras, uh, sorry, sits on top of TensorFlow and provides us with a user-friendly interface to TensorFlow rather than trying to use TensorFlow raw, which would be very complicated. Well, more complicated anyway. But before we look at the code, um, I'm going to talk you through the, the, the broad things it's going to do. Uh, and then I'm going to show you the code. And I'm going to talk through it quite generally. Um, and then in the exercise, you're going to have a chance to, as uh, in your groups, have a look through that code in a bit more detail and then play around and try and adapt uh, that model. So let's talk about what it's going to do first of all. So um, the first thing you'll, um, you should have noticed uh, in downloading the um, the data set that we're going to use today is it's got a number of, uh, the way it's structured, it's got uh, various subfolders. So it's got a test subfolder and a train subfolder. And within that, we've got a, a neg and a pos um, subfolder within, the, within each of these folders. And within each of those, there are a number of individual text files. Um, and those text files, each of which represents a separate review from the Internet Movie Database. Okay, so they've all been split up into negative and positive for both uh, a test set and a training set, okay? We're going to use a nice little method in Keras that allows us, if we structure our, our, uh, our data in that way, we can read it in really quickly and it will automatically um, uh, identify, okay, that's the testing set, that's the training set, these are the negative reviews, these are the positive reviews, and it does all that for us. Um, and it, it's quite handy to use this. Um, so if you're doing this in reality and you were trying to um, uh, train on your own data, this is a good way to structure it. Structure it with a kind of, you know, test set, uh, 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 a test folder, a training folder, and then split into different classes, probably negative and positive uh, within that. And that allows you then to use this little uh, Keras feature, this Keras method, that will easily be able to read in that, that data then. Um, now, I said we're going to have a train validation test split rather than just a train test split. Um, so we've only got training and testing data in our raw data. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave the testing set as is. But in the training data, we're going to carve off a piece of that as our validation data. So uh, the the, uh, the data that we've got is already structured as training data and testing data, but we need a validation set. So we're going to carve off a piece of our training data to be our validation set. And we'll show you how to do that. Then we're going to need to go through these, uh, these processes of um, uh, what we call standardization, uh, vectorization, and embedding. 
So standardization is the stuff that I was talking about, about basically pre-processing our data, getting it ready in the, in, in the right kind of shape. We talked a bit about standardization in um, uh, the normal sort of machine learning terms where we said about, you know, we'll, we'll put all of our features on the uh, feature values on the same scale. Here for text, um, the way in which we're doing that is basically, it's the same sort of thing, uh, but we're doing it with text data. So we're basically cleaning up the text data and making it consistent. So uh, we will remove, because this is um, data from the internet, it'll have um, hypertext markup in it. So we'll get rid of that hypertext markup, first of all. Um, then uh, we're going to uh, make everything lowercase. Then we're going to get rid of punctuation. Uh, and then once we've done that, that standardized text data, we're then going to turn into numbers. And remember, we said that we're going to do that uh, by representing numbers according to the inverse uh, of their frequency. This is a this is a bad example because I should have said we'll also remove stop words, and of course that's the stop word. Um, so that's 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 a poor example, but uh, go with me on this for a moment. Um, so yeah, we're going to vectorize. We're going to uh, represent words according to the inverse of their frequency. So the most common word will have a value of one. The second most common word will have a value of two, etc. Uh, and they will then be put into a vector uh, of numbers that will represent that piece of text. Uh, and then uh, we will embed them. Uh, so the uh, we will basically turn them into the shape, the tensor that the neural network needs. So we're going to clean up the data, standardize it. We're going to vectorize it, turn it into numbers uh, such that we can turn it back again. Um, and uh, we are then going to embed that vector to get it into the right shape. So just a reminder of uh, neural networks, which we're going to use. Remember, neural networks are all built around a network of uh, neurons. Each neuron is performing a relatively simple task. It's taking in a number of inputs uh, which travel along connections, each of which has a weight. It takes a weighted sum of those inputs. So it takes that multiplied by that plus that multiplied by that, etc. Adds them all up um, and then uh, chucks them out uh, to an activation function. The activation function will do something with that. Um, uh, a typical uh, ReLU activation function will just do something simple like if it's positive, then keep the number. If it's negative, then turn it into a zero. Um, and then uh, um, it'll then spit that out the other side, which will either be the final output node, that'll be the raw number that we look at as our output, um, or it'll feed into another layer of uh, neurons. But the key to a neural network is uh, the, the back propagation of the error, the loss. So we work out how wrong we are, uh, and then we use various algorithms to adjust these weights to try and get closer to the correct answer. And basically, a neural network is just layers of these, such that we've got an input layer, which is where we feed in our data. For our case this morning, that's going to be feeding in our shape of numbers that represent the inverse frequency of, of words. Uh, then we will uh, it will go through a number of hidden layers, um, which are the, the, the layers in the middle that do all the magic. And then eventually we'll get down to a single output node in this case again, uh, which will be our output layer. And that will represent a number between zero and one, which will essentially be the probability of it being positive or negative. So po the closer it is to one, the more likely that bundle of words is positive. The closer it is to zero, the more likely it is um, that it's negative. So with all that in mind, let's uh, have a look at um, the, uh, the code file. Um, I'm going to talk through it quite fairly quickly now because you're going to have a chance to, to look at this in more detail. I just want to give you an overview of what these uh, these bits of uh, text are doing. So this is the um, essay with own data uh, .py file um, that you've got as part of um, uh, part of the materials uh, for the session. So uh, let me close down the slides and uh, let's bring this up and I'll expand that a bit. Okay, so uh, there's a, there's a, some comments in here. Uh, apologies, I forgot. Uh, hopefully, you saw my note yesterday. Um, you may, you might be all right without installing these, but I would install them just on the safe side. And TensorFlow installs a lot of this extra stuff automatically now, so it might have done this for you. But um, if uh, if in doubt, just pip install. There are only minor pip installs. Um, hopefully, you've also downloaded the movie dataset. You'll need that uh, in order for this to work. So. 
we're going to uh, start with our imports. Um, we're going to import a, a library here called RE that's used for regular expressions. We talked a little bit about regular expressions last week. There's going to be a bit where we use regular expressions, um, uh, only a very minor bit. It's a single line of code where we use it. Um, but that allows us to do that easily. And we're also going to import the string library, which is really useful in natural language processing. It's got lots of uh, string based methods that we can use to, to um, uh, adapt and modify strings. Uh, then we're going to uh, import TensorFlow. We're importing it um, with an alias here, actually, as TF, um, which I'm guessing is the conventional alias that Google uses, although I don't see it massively used. It's certainly not as uh, widely used as um, uh, Pandas and, and NumPy, but they're obviously trying to get the, uh, the TF alias there. So uh, you're used to seeing this with Pandas and NumPy. Um, then we've got uh, some things from Keras that we're going to uh, import. Uh, much of this is the same as we were importing in module seven. Um, this bit's a bit different. Uh, so here, this is gonna be a text vectorization um, uh, that we're going to import. You're gonna see how that's used in a moment. So that's th those are all our imports. Now, remember, we're gonna need to set up a batch size uh, because we're not gonna chuck all our data through at once. So we're gonna uh, specify a batch size here. We're gonna specify a batch size of 32. So 32 reviews will be passed through at any one time, albeit 32 reviews that have been stripped of stop words and turned into and cleaned up and turned into numbers, but uh, and then put into a text, uh, a tensor blob, but they are 32 reviews. Um, we're also going to use um, a random number seeds so that we get the same results every time. Um, this is really useful when we're when we're training um, in particular. Um, but uh, obviously this can be removed. Um, it's also important though, if you're um, shuffling the data and using a validation split, which is what we'll be doing initially here. Um, then basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna read in um, the text data uh, from our directory split. And we're gonna use this really handy thing that I mentioned um, from Keras that allows us to do this really easily if we've got that, that directory structure set up. Um, and it's the text data set from directory method. Um, so we're gonna use this uh, and we're basically going to um, uh, tell it from the 50,000 reviews that we've got, uh, tell it automatically read in that folder structure. And we can just tell it, this is the training set, this is the test set, uh, and, and we wanna carve off a piece of our um, a piece of our training set as a validation set. Because remember, we've only got a training set and a testing set at the moment. So we're gonna carve off a bit of our training data to be a, a, a validation set. Uh, specifically, we're gonna, we're gonna carve off 20% in this case. So what this is doing is basically um, uh, uh, setting up uh, the, uh, the training set, specifying the, um, the, the path, uh, the file path for that, um, giving it the batch size that we're gonna be using um, so that it can split it up. Um, and then we're gonna say, we want a validation split of 0.2. So 20% of that, this set, this training set I'm giving you, I want you to keep that reserved to a validation set. But this subset that I'm talking about here that I've called raw train DS, um, this is gonna be the training subset, okay? And we'll pass in this random seed. So it'll, it'll always carve off the same 20%. Um, then we're gonna just have a little, uh, a couple of print messages that will basically say, um, uh, we've also really read this in, class zero represents this, class one represents this. So it'll tell us which one is positive and which one is negative. Um, then uh, we're gonna set up our validation set. Remember that's 20%, the 20% we carved here up above. Um, you might think this looks a bit odd because you have to specify the validation split again. Um, it's, it's the way it works. So you have to, um, so here we set up the training set um, and we pass in the, the batch size and the, the random seed to, to keep it consistent. Um, but uh, we tell it, okay, 20% of this data that I'm giving you from uh, the train subfolder, that's gonna be a validation set. But uh, what we're doing here is setting up the other 80% that will be our training set. Here, we're saying, yeah, same, same subfolder as up above, uh, same batch size, same seed, et cetera. Um, the same split is 20% I want, but um, I need uh, this one here that I'm storing as raw val DS rather than raw train DS. This will be my validation set. So here I say, this subset's my validation set. So here I'm storing my training data. 
here I'm storing my, my validation data. And then we need to set up our test data. The test data is easy because we don't need to do anything with that. We're not carving off anything with the test data. Uh, so we just chuck in the test data folder as, as is and give it the batch size. So the seed here, the random seed here, um, we're, we're using this because we're carving off 20%. And we need to make sure that's the same 20% uh, that we are talking about here as here. Otherwise, we could end up using the same values twice. What we're then going to do is we're going to set up um, a, a, a function that is going to standardize our text data. That's all the stuff that we, we you know, want to get rid of um, the HTML markup and um, put everything into lowercase and get rid of the punctuation, that, that kind of stuff there. Um, I've just realized, actually, we don't get rid of uh, stop words here in this tutorial. That's interesting. I forgot that. Um, so uh, that's something you probably do want to do. If you're expanding this, you probably do want to get rid of the stop words as well. So we are keeping stop words here. Um, so we're uh, in this function, the first thing we're going to do is cast everything as a lower case. So we'll take our text, any text that we pass into this function, First thing it'll do is it'll use the, the uh, dot lower method from st the string library, uh, sorry, from the uh, tensorflow.strings library uh, to uh, make everything lowercase. Then we're going to use uh, a regular expression to get rid of um, any HTML. Now, in this case, in these reviews, the only HTML tags that are in there are line breaks, uh, which are these tags here. Um, so all we're going to do is get rid of these, but you can use the same format or any others that you might have in your real data um, if it's come from the internet. Uh, basically, what this regular expression does is it says, take in the, the data that I've now cast as lowercase, and any tags you find, or any uh, um, text you find that looks like this, i.e. a line break tag, replace it with an empty space character. And that'll I'll just kind of go through and do it. And it uses a regular expression uh, behind the scenes to do that. Then once we've got rid of uh, all that, um, then uh, we're also then going to uh, get rid of uh, punctuation. Um, so this is slightly different to the way we did it um, last week. We're basically going to pass in this um, text, which is now lowercase and stripped of HTML, and uh, use this, um, uh, again, this regular expression library, and uh, use the escape method um, to uh, basically say get rid of um, anything that is uh, uh, within the brackets here. Remember string dot punctuation. We looked at that last week. It has a list of the punctuation characters. It's basically a, a well, it's a string. Sorry, that contains all of the, all of the punctuation characters. Um, so if we pass that in, it'll get rid of all those things automatically from our text, and then it'll return it. So it'll return text that is lowercase has been stripped of HTML tags and which has the uh, punctuation removed. Apologies, I, I forgot this This uh, tutorial doesn't actually um, uh, remove stop words, which is interesting. Um, so that's something you, you, we may want to look at. Okay, so that, that function, we can use that when we, we, we want to standardize our data. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is set up something called um, a text vectorization layer. Now, remember vectorization is the thing that we're going to do to turn our um, uh, text into numbers. And remember that the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the uh, the inverse of the words frequency within the text. So the number one will represent the most common word, etc. Um, and we're going to have, uh, we're only going to store the X most common words and everything else we'll ignore. Um, and we also need to make sure that um, all of the uh, the the resultant reviews are the same size because they all need to be the same size when they go through the network. Um, so it represents the number of words in this case. So we're going to pick um, ten thousand, the ten thousand most common words, and we're going to have a, a, a sequence length uh, sequence sequence length of two hundred and fifty. So all reviews will be two hundred and fifty words. If they're longer than that, we ignore everything uh, from the two hundred fifty first word onwards. It just gets chopped off. Anything shorter than that, reviews that are shorter than that, we will pad out with this dummy uh, uh, word, uh, dummy value of zero, which basically means it's a, it's a padding word. Um, then we're going to set up uh, one of these. Um, it's like a little standalone layer of the network. 
at the moment this is going to be standalone but you'll see in a moment that we'll then end up putting it into the network but we're just doing, having a little standalone layer that it, its only purpose is to convert our text into numbers so we're going to call it a text factorization layer um we are uh, going to standardize it according to custom standardization that's the name of the function we wrote above so it'll tell it uh, when we give you this uh, text in this layer, the first thing you, you're going to do is call that function to standardize the text. The maximum number of tokens, that's our, how many most common words do we want? So that's the max features that we set up here. Um, the output mode is how do we want our text represented? How do we want our words represented? Int basically means give us them as integers. And uh, our output sequence length is basically our maximum number of words for a review, which is we set up up here as 250. So that sets up a layer ready for, for use. And then down here, um, we uh, are basically going to start that process. So um, we first extract just uh, the review text, so not the labels, not the outputs, whether it's a one or a zero, just the text itself, so that we've got a text only data set. Um, and the way we're going to do that is using um, a little thing called Lambda function. Now, Lambda functions are neat little things in, in Python that basically, they're a bit like little mini disposable functions that you write and execute immediately. Um, so here we've got a Lambda function. We don't even give it a name. We just say, if I give you X and Y, I only want X back. That's basically what that little bit of code says. I'll give you two things, just give me back the first thing. You can see it's like a very abbreviated form of a function, except it has no name. We've denoted it using a keyword lambda, to know it's a lambda function, but here are our inputs and here's the return. So we say, I'll give you X and Y, you give me X. The little lambda function they're quite they're quite neat in some circumstances so basically what our function here is going to do is going to take x and y x will be our review text and y will be the classification one or a zero and we just want the review text back and then we're gonna on that on that training text which remember we've taken from the raw training data um that we are so that's from our training set which will be the training data we've got in our subfolder with the 20% carved off for the validation set, that's gone. Um, and we're then going to apply, uh, we're going to, sorry, we're going to adapt our vectorized layer, the thing we set up above that's going to turn our text into numbers. We're going to use this training text to adapt it. So that training text is going to be used to convert our words into numbers. Uh, then we are going to apply that uh, uh, that layer. Uh, this function, um, uh, which we've called vectorized text, will basically take in uh, text and uh, label data. Um, and uh, basically it'll return, it'll apply this vectorized layer we wrote above and return the vectorized text. So we'll give it the raw text and it'll use the vectorized layer we put up above that said, we want it as uh, um, integers. We want the 10,000 most common words. We want reviews no longer than 250. Um, and, oh, sorry, we want reviews of size 250. Um, and it'll do all that for us. And here's basically, and that's what it'll then return our nicely vectorized uh, uh, shape. So our reviews will turn into uh, vectors of numbers in the way we specified up above. This expand dims thing, don't worry too much about that. Basically, it's just, it gets it into the, um, it reshapes the tensor basically so that it can uh, go through the vectorized layer we've written above. Don't worry too much about the details of that. So once we've adapted that pre-processing layer, um, we're then going to, uh, we need to adapt all three of our training, uh, sorry, all three of our data sets. We've got a training set, we've got a validation set, and we've got a test set. And we're gonna, we need to map that vectorization to all three of them. Uh, so we are going to uh, we are going to do that um, by applying this uh, vectorized text. Uh, um, sorry, uh, using the vectorized text from the training set, uh, and then applying that vectorization to all three of our data sets. Once we've done that, we've now got three data sets that contain. Uh, so 
you can see here I've called them train DS, foul DS, and test DS, which distinguishes from the, I scroll up, the raw data, which will be stored as raw text, the strings uh, have the prefix raw. So that allows us to keep our raw data, but also um, to uh, distinguish that we've got a separate data set which contain that raw text data, but as numbers, as our vectorized numbers. Then we're going to build the neural network. I'm not going to go into the details um, of, uh, of this here because I want you to have a look through this uh, in a moment when you're looking in the uh, in the uh, exercise. Uh, but we're basically going to set this up um, with uh, 16 um, hidden units. Remember, that's the number of neurons per hidden layer. Uh, we're going to set it up with um, uh, an embedding layer. The embedding layer will basically get things um, into uh, the right uh, the right shape for us. Uh, then we're going to have a dropout layer, which remember dropout helps us uh, randomly switches neurons off to prevent overfitting. Then we're going to have something called a global average pooling 1D layer. Um, that's a neural network layer that basically squashes everything down into one dimension. Um, and it, it, it basically uses pooled averages and stuff to do that. Um, and it again can help us uh, avoid overfitting. Then we'll also have a dropout layer after that. And then we'll have our final layer, which will be a, a single neuron, um, but will be densely connected. So that's, this will be our output number, but everything for the previous layer will connect into it, hence why it's densely connected. But I'll let, I won't go through the detail. I want you to have a look at that um, yourself when in your, in your groups. It'll then print a summary of the model so we can see what it looks like, our neural network. Uh, then we compile the model much as we did before. We're going to use the Adam optimizer. Remember, if in doubt, use Adam. Uh, it's, we're going to use the binary cross entropy uh, loss function. We've got a binary classification problem. That's a, that's a, that's a good uh, approach for this. Um, we're, this you won't have seen before. This is, uh, I've said, from logits equals true. Basically, um, uh, when, you, when we convert up, because we haven't got a layer at the end that is using an activation function, like a sigmoid function at the moment, that will convert everything between zero and one, we can use this from logits equals true, and it will do that for us. Um, but I'll come back to that uh, in a moment, because then we're going to stuff this on the end. So basically, we'll compile our model. We're going to set up uh, 20 epochs, tr uh, 20 training time units, so 20 times that the uh, all of the batches of data will go through our model. Then we'll fit it, as much as we did before. So we're going to train our model. We'll pass in the training data. We'll tell it this is the validation data, so it can monitor that as it goes along as well. Here's how many epochs um, we want, which we specified up above. And remember, verbose equals one just basically says, give me all of the information as you're training. Um, if we if we can turn that off if we prefer. Then we can have a look to see how well it trained. Um, what we're also going to do is this end thing, because if we want um, our model to be able to process new text data, which is the whole point of doing this, um, then we're also going to have to, with that new text data, vectorize them to convert those words into, into numbers too. Um, now, we could chuck that through manually, the vectorization layer that we set up above. But actually, a better way uh, would be uh, to bung that uh, vectorization layer uh, on at the start of our neural network. And then at the end of the neural network, much as we had with the Titanic data, we'll have a sigmoid activation, um, uh, fun, uh, sigmoid activation layer that will basically um, turn our final number into a number between zero and one, which will represent a probability. So basically, the new model will be um, a vectorization layer, the, the one we set up above, that we were manually chucking stuff through. So we, we will chuck through the raw data. It will then get vectorized, turned into numbers. Then it'll go through the pre-trained model that we've set up above. And then it'll go through a sigmoid activation function at the end, which will turn it into a probability with the number closer to one, meaning it's more likely to be positive, number closer to zero, meaning it's more likely to be negative. Again, I'm going over this quite quickly, but you're going to have lots of opportunity in a moment to have a look through this. Uh, then we will compile that model. So we've got this new model, which consists of the raw stuff in the middle, 
the vectorization bit at the start. So we can just chuck through raw data and then the uh, thing at the end, which will output a probability. So let's run it, see what happens. So I'm going to run this. Um, it'll be uh, interesting to see how quickly this runs on, on your, your various computers. It runs very uh, pretty quickly on mine, um, but I've got quite a fast computer. So be aware that if it's taking a very long, well, if it's taking a hugely long time, just make sure you've removed that unsup uh, uh, directory as per the instructions. Otherwise, you'll have an absolute nightmare with this. Um, but uh, it, it shouldn't be unreasonable on most on most computers uh, to run this. So it's, uh, it's up to uh, Epoch 10 at the moment. You can see this is the training accuracy. It's getting up to about 92, 93%. This is looking good. Okay. It's looking like it's pretty strong accuracy on this. Um, but we're um, if we have a look at the validation accuracy, um, we can see that's not quite as good. There's a bit of a gap, which might, of course, indicate overfitting. Let's have a look. So uh, final results, then we tested uh, the final model on the uh, test data set. We've got, we remember we've got a loss and an accuracy. Loss we want as low as possible, that's error. And accuracy we want as high as possible. So we've got a lowish loss um, and we've got about 86% accuracy. So it's not bad, it's pretty good. But it does look like there's overfitting going on here because if you look at the, um, the training accuracy, We've got 95% accuracy on the training set. That indicates we've overfitted a bit because we're only getting about 86% on the test data. And the validation accuracy, we're getting about 88%. So again, it's a bit, it's quite a bit below what we're getting on the training data. That indicates we're overfitting. As we've seen before, there's a bit of a gap uh, between them. But it's not bad. It's not a bad start at all. So just before we get on to the, um, the exercise, we're just going to talk uh, through a, uh, a few extra little bits. So we can see from that model that it is it appears to be overfitting a little bit. And we talked about overfitting in, in module seven and what we can do about that. One of the things, remember, that we can do so that we've got things like uh, dropout in there. We can play with the dropout. One of the things we can do, we remember, we mentioned a callback called early stopping. So I'm only going to go over this quite quickly because we've talked about it before. But early stopping is basically a little callback that we can use to say it, one problem with uh, uh, the, um, where overfitting arises is we're just letting the model train for too long. We saw if we look back at this uh, data, we see the training data just keeps getting better and better. It's getting up to the high 90s. The validation data gets up to the high 80s and then plateaus. It doesn't tend to improve much. Um, and that's because then it's starting to learn things that are too specific to the training data. So it's getting better at the training data, but then uh, anything beyond that, it's not getting so good at. It's finding stuff that's too unique to the training data. So one approach is to stop the training before it gets to that point. Um, so we can either do that manually or we can use this early stopping callback um, to say, look, here's a threshold. If things don't improve by this much, within this number of epochs, what we call our patience level, then stop because we're going to overfit if we carry on. Um, and so I won't go through the code here, but if you look at um, uh, the file essay with own data early stopping, look at line 270 onwards, everything before that is exactly the same. You'll see how we use the early stopping callback. We should look very, uh, fairly familiar to you because we used it in the uh, machine learning module as well. So it's the same same principle we're using here. Okay, let's uh, let's get on to uh, the exercise, which is the bulk of what you're going to be uh, doing this morning. So um, first thing you're going to do is go off and have a, a, a 10, 10, 15 minute break, uh, go and stretch your legs. But then I want you to, in your groups, uh, I want you to do the following. The first thing I want you to do is go back through the essay with own data.py uh, file. Uh, and go through it line by line with one person sharing the screen um, and talking through what each aspect of the code is doing to make sure you really understand um, how all that's working. As I say, I was just uh, sort of skimming over it quite quickly, um, but I want you to have a proper look at that. Then once you've done that, have a look at the essay with own data early stopping. Uh, you only need to look at line 270 onwards because everything before that is the same to see how the early stopping uh, uh stuff has been implemented um just flag up the uh early stopping um uh that i've put in is actually a really impatient early stopping it has a patience level of one epoch and it demands quite a significant change so um I, i've done that by default 
once you've done that, once you've um, had a good look through and give yourself enough time to, to look through those things, I want you to then try applying um, the model to predict the sentiment of new unseen text. Um, and to do that, um, I would advise you first take a copy of um, the essay with own data early stopping file, which is the most complete one. Take a copy of that. And then at the end of that file, I want you to, so basically I want you to store some text, um, like a, you could write your own review or find a review online or something that you want to analyze the sentiment of, put it into a .txt file uh, and put it in the same directory as your .py files. And then open the file and read the whole thing into a string in one go using the, uh, the .read method of the file object. So f.read, you've seen that before. Um, then use, um, so remember, you're not training on this data, you're training on the IMDB data that you're reading in from your data sets. That's, that's, your, that's your training. Here, we're going to see how good it is. If we've trained it on movie uh, data, how good is it at something else? Or, I mean, you could try on another movie review, or you could try it on something completely different. Try lots of things. Um, try multiple pieces of text. What we're going to do is use the dot predict method of the exported model. This is why we're writing it at the end. So we've trained the model. We're going to use the dot predict method. We pass in the string of text that we've read in from that uh, file that we've uh, created. And it'll then predict the sentiment. Now, uh, just as a little note, you have to pass that in as a list, even if you've only got one uh, thing that you're passing in. And then I want you to print a message specifying whether the sentiment is predicted to be positive or negative based on, so you'll get a number out. It'll be between zero and one. We'll assume it's based on the probability of uh, 0 0.5. Uh, so if the number that comes out is above 0 0.5, then we say it's positive, the review is, or the text is positive. And print the output probability next to that as well. So try to put that in. So the, the, the code you need to do here is, is trivial. Okay, and I've explained exactly how you need to do it. That should take you almost no time at all. Um, what I want you to really do is to play around with this model. So try lots of different pieces of text. See how well the model performs. Try ones where the sentiment is a bit less clear or is a bit more mixed. Try changing different aspects of your model uh, to try and improve its performance. So you could try changing the training length, try changing the early stopping parameters, try changing the dropout rates, try different batch sizes. Um, be careful about going too big. Um, try different training and validation splits. Try changing the structure of your neural network. Add layers, add neurons, take them away, change the dropout rates, etc. Okay. I want you to have a really good play around with this stuff. So take copies of your original file. So you've still got that. But then just have a really good play around and try lots of different things. And I want to see when we come back. Uh, so you're going to have until about 12 o'clock, just after 12. Um, I want to see if any groups have managed to to improve the uh, the baseline performance we're getting for the model. Okay, go and have a 10, 15 minute break. Uh, I'll open up the rooms now so you can jump in uh, when you're ready and we'll float around, but have fun. Go and, uh, go and have a play around with this stuff. But the first thing to do is to look through these code files and make sure you're happy with how it all works. Okay, let me stop sharing. And of course my Zoom has crashed, so apologies, give me two seconds. You can probably still hear me. Hi everyone. Okay, welcome back. Um, so uh, there's just a little bit more that I wanted to cover um, very briefly uh, before we break for lunch. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of it just to sort of flag it up more than anything. Um, but before I do that, I, I just wanted to, um, so I noticed that going around a few of the groups um, that you all, uh, a lot of you are getting stuck around the same kind of bit in the code. And it's uh, uh, partly because it's a bit more complicated and partly because I didn't explain it very well. So uh, the vectorization stuff, basically just to explain um what you're kind of doing with that is setting up a little mini layer um and your that the, the purpose of that mini neural network la layer is it's just going to do a vectorization i turn text into uh, numbers but the way it does that 
Um, you recall when we talked about machine learning before, we've said how if we if we kind of stand, remember when we talked about um, normalization and standardization. So um, normalization is easy because you just put everything between zero and one. But standardization uh, in um, machine learning basically means putting all the features on a scale such that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Now that can differ depending on the date, the underlying data that you're using. That distribution will look different. So the way we do it, we only use, we fit that around the training data. And then we use that fit for any other data like the test data, validation data, et cetera. We don't fit it on the test or the validation data because the machine is not supposed to see that. It's the same principle here. So we we when we um, set up the vectorization layer, we have to tell it how it's going to do it. What, what text is it going to use to work out the numbers? Because it needs to find the 10,000 most common, et cetera. Um, so the way in which it does it, we have to give it some data to use. Uh, so we we tell it only use the training data. That's the data we're going to give you. So if the word um, armadillo comes up as the 400th most common word in the training data, the word armadillo will be given the number 400 in the test data and the validation data too. That also means that any words that are in the test set or the validation set that are not in the training data will not be represented. OK, because uh, and it, they shouldn't be because it's not that's not in the training. It's not seen that. Um, so uh, that's why we do it. We have to make sure there's no sort of bleed through from the, the the test data into the training data. So it uses the training data. We tell it we're going to set up a little machine that's going to convert words into numbers. Um, and I want you to base that on the the text in the training data. And then we apply that. And then once uh, we've got that vectorization, we then uh, put that that uh, vectorization onto the three data sets. So we apply the same, uh, the vectorization is basically just saying, if you find the word armadillo, it's the number 400. Um, so uh, we apply that uh, in using the same rules to all three training sets, uh, sorry, all three data sets, the training, the validation, and the test set. So that's why there's kind of those three or four steps that you go through um, to do that you're setting up the machine and then you're saying I want you to fit that to whatever's in the text in the training set um, and then uh, and then we write a little function that will do it and then we call that function and then we apply that to um, the three data sets separately um, so it's a bit it's a bit more difficult to get your head around if you sort of think about it in those terms uh, it makes it a little bit more straightforward. Um, did anyone get to the point where they managed to uh, fiddle around with the model, uh, adapt it in any way? Did anybody manage to do that and improve the performance? Just while you're thinking, I'm going to shut the door because my cat's going off. I'll take the silence as a no uh, that you didn't manage to get through. Um, have a go at that in your own times. Um, so uh, uh, it's uh, it's one of those things that the, the primary thing I wanted you to look at this morning was getting your head around this a little bit, get, giving you a bit more practice with neural networks, but in a slightly different uh, way for, for this kind of thing. Um, another question came up uh, that I think is worth answering um, in, in the wider group as well around, does this mean that if I want to do sentiment analysis on patient survey data, for example, that I've got to find, you know, 50,000 patient surveys and manually go through and mark them all as positive and negative? Um, the answer to that, if you want to train it purely on your data, is yes, you would have to do that. Um, uh, in some cases, that's possible because uh, we've worked with Trust before that have been manually doing this so they've already got the data to indicate whether survey responses are positive or negative and therefore we can use that but generally speaking what you tend to do um, is to use a pre-trained model or as we have here a model that's been trained on a, an existing data set um, and then see how that performs and then remember we can use this thing called transfer learning which is where we start with a um uh, a, a, a sort of model, a pre-trained model or a, a, um, a, a good data set that we can train on initially um, that's already available and then to sort of get all the basics out of the way. And then we can just add to that training with our own examples um, to help it 
maybe learn things that it hasn't seen before if there are sort of more niche things in there so it very much depends on on, on what you want to do um but usually you would start uh, uh you could i mean you could even start if you had that problem you wanted to look at patient survey data you could try it with um the internet movie databases you've done this morning can we if we train a model based on movie reviews how good is it at picking up positive and negative uh sentiment in uh things that patients say about our service it might be it's really good um but it might be you need something else so um you can you can try these different things um so just before we uh break for lunch i'm just going to very quickly um uh, uh just whiz through uh a couple of the uh, remaining slides um so um we've talked so far about um sentiment analysis and about whether something is positive or negative or maybe neutral um Imagine we've got something like this, though. Imagine somebody, we were looking at patient survey data and somebody's written, the care from the staff was absolutely fantastic. They made me feel safe and nothing was too much trouble. But when I was discharged, I had to wait over five hours for my prescribed medications at the pharmacy. This is atrocious. OK, now the problem with this. There are clearly both positive and negative aspects to that review. OK. Using what the approach we've uh, looked at so far, we'd have to classify it um, either as positive or negative, or we could um, have a multi-label model in using the same sort of structure and have, uh, um, uh, uh, well, sorry, no, I'll come back to that. We, we could we could have a um, three different labels. So rather than a binary classification, um, we could have, is it positive, negative, or neutral? Let's imagine we were doing that. We adapted our model. We'll say a one is positive, a minus one is a negative, and a zero is, is neutral. Would this help? Well, if we were to consider that review overall as positive, then essentially we're making an assumption that the care from the staff, which they thought was excellent, was more important to the reviewer than the weight at the pharmacy. Now that may be true, but we are assuming that, we don't know. Similarly, if we rate it as negative, then we're assuming the weight at the pharmacy was more important to that patient than the care from the staff. Again, that could be true, but we don't know. And if we weight it as neutral, what we're essentially doing is saying the reviewer weighted uh, those two aspects equally, such that their overall feeling about the service was neither positive nor negative. Again, that might be true, but we are making an assumption. We don't know that. So what can we what can we do about that? There's two basically basically two main solutions to this. We can either have a, a multi-label model, which is where Rather than just having a single output uh, node, uh, a single output neuron at the end, which outputs a single number, we can have two neurons and it'll say, this is the probability of it being positive. This is the probability of it being negative. And, the, um, and therefore we can, we can say, okay, well, uh, we think it's, it's, it's quite strongly positive, but it also has quite a lot of negative in it as well. So we can classify as both positive and negative at the same time with different weightings. That's possible. The other approach is we can use something called um, aspect level sentiment analysis. And this is basically where we try to break down the review into individual aspects. So in, in the example here, that would be the care from the staff, the weight at the pharmacy. These are different things that they're talking about within the same service and analyze the sentiment of those individual aspects instead, recognizing they'll be talking about multiple different things. Both of these approaches can work and it depends on what you what you want to do. If you're more interested in trying to find out um, what the uh, what things people felt positively and negatively about, then you probably want something around aspect level sentiment analysis, because otherwise you're just going to end up with a well, this, uh, uh, you know, most of our reviews were weighted more positively than negatively. And that might be useful in itself, but you might want to dive a little bit deeper. Um, so. The basically aspect level sentiment analysis is exactly the same as standard sentiment analysis. The only difference is that we have to split our text into different aspects first. Okay, that's not necessarily that easy. Okay, so consider this um, uh, paragraph. I tried to get through using the supply telephone number first, but nobody answered after 10 minutes, uh, so I gave up. I then decided to go to the surgery in person, but I was waiting for ages here too. Uh, the receptionist I spoke to was uh, very rude. When I finally saw a nurse, she was incredibly helpful and put my mind at ease. I thought the coffee from the coffee machine was excellent too. Makes a change. And there's quite a lot of stuff that somebody's talking about there. 
In fact, I would say there's five different aspects of that. There's the weight trying to get through on the telephone. There's the weight when attending the surgery in person. There's the rudeness of the receptionist. There's the helpfulness of the nurse. And there's the quality of the coffee from the coffee machine. Th those are five pretty separate aspects. Maybe three and four might come together as a, a kind of staffing issue. But certainly if you were trying to tackle this stuff, these are kind of five separate things that you'd need to look at and five things that the reviewer feels independently about. So how might you try and look for these things? One option might be that we look for our good old friends noun phrases uh, back from last week. Um, noun phrases often referred to as noun chunks in, in natural language processing. Uh, you'll see that referred to as noun chunks in, in, in spacey. Um, remember noun phrases are just phrases that have a noun as their head and then the words that around it that modify that in in some way um and there's i won't go through it now but there's a little um a piece of code that you can run very simple piece of code that shows you how spacey can identify um noun chunks and i did that uh, and in fact the code um uh, that you've got uh, does that for this paragraph that we've just looked at these are the noun phrases that it's uh, picked up it, in fact it picks up a few extra ones uh, around the pronouns of i and she but if we were to remove those, because it's quite easy to remove um, pronouns, um, then actually we find that it has kind of picked up the stuff we want, but there's a lot of noise in there as well. OK, um, so it might help us a little bit, it might help us find some stuff, but you'd have to be able to filter out the noise um, or use it as a way of homing in on particular sentences to say, I think there's an aspect being described here. Um, so it's possible, but... Um, in reality, there's a whole subfield around um, aspect level sentiment analysis. Um, a lot of these approaches actually use um, uh, neural networks and specifically use the transformer based stuff that we talked about last week, which is how Spacey works. Uh, the, these concepts of attention and uh, context uh, being embedded um, to try and work out what are the things that people are, are talking about. So there's a lot of independent work that goes into um, aspect level sentiment analysis. It's not a trivial uh, problem uh, but it is an interesting problem um, and it's something to bear in mind when you're you're doing this kind of stuff ideally if you were going in with the uh provisor of, you know we're gonna we're gonna do a uh, um a survey um and you're at the survey design stage of course you might want to think about how you um structure your survey such that people can put comments around individual aspects and structuring in that way uh knowing that this is potentially problematic uh, if you come to do some sentiment analysis, if everything's just shoved in uh, a single box. Um, so if the question isn't kind of focused enough, that, that can be a, uh, a problem. Um, also, just to sort of finish off with this little, um, little word of warning, which we've mentioned in the machine learning before, be mindful as with any machine learning problem that you you need good representation from your uh, all of your classes that you're trying to predict. So if you've got a binary classification problem, you need lots of positives and you need lots of negatives too. Um, when we did some work years ago uh, using set of analysis on, on some survey data, um, we found that actually most of their data was positive because people tend to, you know, if you ask them about the care they've received, they tend to be quite grateful for the care. So you will find that people generally talk quite positively about, about stuff. There will be things that they will talk negatively about that you are the, presumably interested in because that's the stuff you want to try and fix. Um, but that may be a smaller proportion uh, outweighed by people who are just writing glowing things about, you know, the lovely care, et cetera, they receive. So be aware of that, that this is not, this is an issue in sentiment analysis, as with any machine learning, that you need to make sure um, your your classes are, 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 are uh, well represented. Um, you can actually use synthetic data methods as well to generate synthetic natural language data, but it's a little bit more complicated than, than what we covered last week. So just a couple of extra things to, to sort of bear in mind there uh, when you're doing sentiment analysis. But hopefully this morning has given you a bit of a, a indication about this. This stuff's actually quite, quite powerful um, and quite a nice way to be able to uh, automatically classify the sentiment of, of um, text. Of course, one other thing you can do, you can use uh, this in combination with things like named entity recognition to pull out the, the things that people are talking about, as well as the way in which they're talking about things. So there's all sorts of things that you can you can do around this. Okay, 
let's uh, let's stop there. Let's break for lunch um, this afternoon. Um, we are going to have a much lighter session, hopefully quite a fun session, introducing the world of uh, cellular automata uh, as we dive into behavioural AI. So we'll resume at one thirty as ever. You can remain on the call, uh, but just make sure your mics and cameras are off. I can see a van has pulled up, so I will stop recording there and run to the door. See see you in an hour.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can I just check you can hear me? Can somebody just confirm that? Yes, we can. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's because I'm sharing in video mode um, that uh, I can't see my own face, so it's a bit disconcerting. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad you can hear me. Okay, so um, obviously this morning we finished off our, our, our journey through um, natural language processing. Um, I think I said before that um, the uh, 7D session was probably the sort of the uh, the hardest session in in the course um, because that introduced neural networks. I think probably actually the one you did this morning might have been because of course it needs that uh, plus uh, all the text vectorization uh, stuff on top. Um, the good news, well, there's uh, two bits of good news. First, first of all, the, the uh, this afternoon session uh, is going to be completely different. It's uh, it's it's not at all technical, um, and is a very different kind of session than than you've been used to. Um, and the second thing is, I think uh looking forward now at all the modules that you have remaining on on the program i think you've passed the peak of difficulty so i, I reckon the the kind of the machine learning stuff is probably you know especially the neural network stuff is some of the more technically difficult um stuff that we cover um from here on out um i i i would think actually that most of this stuff um will seem a, a, a quite a breath of fresh air <laughs> compared to uh, some of the really heavy stuff um that you've been doing um, so um, th this afternoon we're going to um, introduce uh, the modeling behavior uh, module um, by talking about cellular automata. Now, um, most of this module is going to be dedicated to agent-based simulation, which is what we're going to get on to uh, in earnest next week. Um, but we'll talk a bit about cellular automata today. Um, so my background is in agent-based simulation. That That's what I did my PhD in. And I'll talk more about that next week and also in the... Uh, reinforcement learning session that you've got right at the end of the uh, the phase one training um but uh as i say my background's in this and i've i've always wanted to see and yet and haven't yet uh, a really good agent-based simulation hsma project um uh, by the way I, I i don't mean we've had some and they haven't been good i mean we haven't had any we haven't had any um uh, agent-based simulation projects that, that have come through so um i'm hoping this will be the year uh, when we get some really interesting um, agent-based um, simulation uh, stuff uh, within within the project work, because I think there's a lot of scope for it. It is a little bit more abstract than some of the stuff that you've been uh, used to so far, particularly the things I'm going to be covering this afternoon around cellular automata. Um, so it takes a kind of different way of thinking. And the, the reason I'm... So this, this afternoon's session is uh, a little bit more like a... Think of it as a sort of an episode of QI, where I'm going to be talking to you about some stuff that I think is quite interesting, and hopefully you will too, mainly uh, to get you thinking in a different kind of way. Um, so to uh, start you, uh, your brain sort of moving into a slightly different way of thinking than you've been used to using uh, for, for some of the other approaches that we, we, we've tackled on the course, particularly things like discrete event um, simulation. So it's going to be a bit a bit different. Um, I'm going to show you some weird and wonderful stuff. There will be points where you think, um, what on earth is he is he going on about this for? <laughs> um, but hopefully you will find it interesting and hopefully it will help to uh, get you into that, that sort of frame of thinking. Uh, I would point out that I'm going to be talking about concepts like the edge of chaos this afternoon. Th this isn't stuff you're going to need to memorize. This isn't stuff you're going to need to know about uh, in that way. Um, again, it's just to get you sort of thinking and appreciating how this kind of modeling can be a little bit different, but can also open up a lot of uh, a lot of doors to, to stuff that we wouldn't um, uh, normally be able to cover with some of the uh, some of the more traditional uh, modeling methods. Apologies, I'm just going to fix my chair because it's just collapsed in two seconds. There we go. I felt like I was descending to the floor. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, start talking um, this afternoon about uh, cellular automata. Uh, now, here's a note that I wrote to myself because I assumed I would forget to uh, optimize the video for this session. Well, I didn't. So uh, Dan clearly didn't know Dan as well as uh, he thought he did. Um, so I did remember Dan. Thank you. OK. So. 
so far, when we've talked about um, uh, modeling, we've talked about things like uh, discrete event simulation. That's been a primary focus for us. Um, uh, and that's you know, that's a quite a big thing within operational research. Um, but those kind of modeling methods focus on the processes within a system. Things happen to the entities that are flowing through. They go through a number of processes. But sometimes, we have to recognize that the things that are flowing through our system, things within our system, have their own behaviors. And it might be that we're, we're modeling humans and they have their own behaviors. It doesn't have to be humans. We could be thinking of um, uh, uh, non-living things that have their own sort of behaviors as systems. Um, and sometimes those behaviors are important. So sometimes they're not. So if we're interested in a queuing problem, um, we might model aspects of behavior around queuing. Uh, we talked about sort of reneging and bulking and that kind of jockeying and those kind of queuing behaviors in discrete event. But if we're only interested in a kind of queuing problem, we don't, we tend to ignore anything that people might do outside of that. Um, but sometimes the behavior is actually the central thing of interest. So in this module, we're basically going to be looking at how we can model uh, aspects of behavior within real world systems um, using a, a type of approach called agent-based um, simulation. And I'll say that's my background. My background is entirely around this, um, uh, albeit from an ecological standpoint. Um, we're going to look this afternoon at a particular type of agent-based simulation, a very specific type known as a cellular automaton uh, or the plural cellular automata. Um, these are a particular type that are quite abstract, um, uh, but they will give you an idea about some of the core concepts of agent-based simulation. Now, it might be uh, that you are inspired this afternoon um, to come up with an idea for a project that uses a cellular automaton. That would be fantastic and is perfectly doable. It will require a level of abstract thinking, which you're going to practice today, um, but that is possible. What's more likely is that when we move into the agent-based simulation properly next week and we look at what we can do generally with agent-based simulation, not just looking at the uh, cellular automaton, um, then you'll see actually there's the hopefully there's all sorts of things that you can do because potentially agent-based simulations as you'll see next week can do pretty much anything we like but cellular automata is a good place to start because it's kind of the purest distillation of what it means to be an agent-based simulation they operate within very simple strict rules okay so let's talk about cellular automata so the core components of uh, cellular automata are that we have an n-dimensional uh, grid of cells usually one or two dimensional but it can go beyond that oops god my chair is not not liking it um each cell is in uh, one of a number of different states and time advances in time steps called generations okay so we've got um uh, a, a grid of cells that may be one usually one or two dimensional um each of those cells can be in one of uh, a number of different states and then time advances through uh, these generations. Now, the states of those cells might change in each generation, in each time step, according to certain rules. And the rules that determine the state of a cell in any given generation usually depend only on the state of the cell in a previous generation and or the state of the cells around it, which we refer to as the neighborhood. So whatever state that cell is in now, along with the states that its neighbors are in, usually determines what state it's in in the next generation. And we'll come back to um, some examples of this so you can see how this works in practice. So why do we use them? Well, it turns out in the natural world, there are many different phenomena that we can't explain using conventional mathematics. So did you know, for example, that the formation of a snowflake can't be explained using conventional math uh, mathematics? This uh, causes mathematicians uh, a great deal of headaches because they like everything to be explainable. And we can't. We can't explain that using conventional mathematics. The formation of patterns on a seashell can't be explained using conventional mathematics. And indeed, there are, as well as in the natural world, there are examples in human systems that we see, uh, such as things like the formation of traffic jams. 
and the spread of crime that have been modelled using cellular automata approaches and found to be very effective at modelling these kinds of things. So um, the whole thing of, you know, wh where uh, you're, you're in traffic and suddenly there's a traffic jam and uh, uh, you, you eventually the traffic jam clears and there's no clear reason why that's happened. It doesn't even an accident or anything like that. Um, and it's usually because of one little thing that somebody's made one small decision on the road, changing lanes, perhaps where they where they shouldn't have, that has then had a knock on impact and caused this system level impact. Uh, and it's that kind of thing that the cellular automata can expose because it models these very simple individual level rules that people do something or an individual cell does something, then it has this knock on population level impact. And the common thing about all of this is that uh, um, within not just cellular automata, but within agent based uh, simulation more generally, is that these phenomena are arising emergently. So the key thing to remember about agent based simulation is you have simple rules that are consistently applied at an individual level, but which lead to emergent dynamics or behaviours, some of which can be incredibly complicated. But what's happening at the individual level is actually very simple. They're just following very simple rules, but that's leading to this very complex appearing behaviour. Um, Agent-based simulation is, is hugely used in uh, ecological modelling. Um, so as I say, my PhD was in... Uh, modeling bumblebee foraging uh, using agent-based simulation uh, combined with reinforcement learning. Um, the idea being that we would uh, try to build a, a model, an agent-based model of the way in which an individual bumblebee behaves. And we can describe that using simple rules. We know that they are energy efficient. We know the way in which they tend to forage. So we can build in simple rules that say, okay, well, I'm trying to fill up with nectar as quickly as possible. So I'm going to be making uh, economic decisions about uh, whether I should stay here or whether I should uh, move to another uh, patch of flowers. But in doing that, I'm expending energy and I can't go very long without um, filling up food. Um, so we can we can have very simple rules that, that say that trade off, basically making simple economic trade off decisions. And it turns out that kind of stuff is really good. I mean, when we uh, did an empirical study comparing the uh, uh, the model that we developed as part of my PhD uh, compared to what we observed real bumblebees doing. And we found the model was, a, was an extremely powerful predictor. So, I mean, so much so that my uh, supervisor said nobody will ever believe that, <laughs> that it was so accurate. But it turns out these th sort of things are really powerful. Just by ex having these very simple individual level rules that can then be expanded up to a population level. So, you know, not just bees, but we know a lot of animals are efficient foragers that are trying to gather food as quickly as possible. We, we And very often we know a lot about that individual forager in terms of what, what will motivate them, but less about what the population level dynamics might look like or what the system level dynamics might look like. So agent-based simulation can uh, step in by essentially modeling those individual level behaviors and seeing what happens at a population level at a system level. Um, Agent-based simulation, incidentally, I, I always knew it as individual-based modelling. That's how it's referred to uh, uh, in, in ecology, IBM. So it's not just uh, ecological applications that we can think of either. Um, uh, in fact, we can think of uh, models uh, that represent the individual behaviours, motivations and interactions of human beings within systems and try and understand what the emergent dynamics might look like at a population or system level. Um, I, I think COVID is, is a pretty good example. You can, you can think about the way in which people behave and people interact as being something that you can model uh, and that leading to uh, uh, quite significant population system level consequences. In fact, um, agent-based simulation is quite widely used for uh, modeling disease spread for that very reason. And in fact, uh, the task you'll do next week will be doing exactly that. You'll be building a model of um, a, a fictional uh, disease uh, and how it's spread for a population. So let's have a look at going back to cellular automata. Remember, that's a sort of subset of uh, Asian based simulation that, that uh, is kind of a pure distillation of this stuff and has very simple, um, very strict rules. So let's have a look at an example of cellular automata. And this is one that I've just made up. Uh, so here I've got a 2D uh, um, CA, a cellular automaton. Um, 
and I've got my grid of cells in those two dimensions. And each cell is in one of three states. Uh, it can either be off, uh, which is in white, uh, blue, uh, or green. So any cell in that grid is always in one of those states. Um, and I'm going to define my neighborhood um, using a more neighborhood. We'll talk more about neighborhoods in a moment. Um, a more neighborhood basically means the neighborhood of a cell is the cell itself uh, plus all of the uh, surrounding cells. So in this case, this is the more neighborhood. Um, and I'm just going to have two very simple rules here for my cellular automaton. I'm going to say that if a cell is off in generation T and there are green or blue cells present in the neighbors, then that cell should become switched on to blue or green, depending on which cells are most prevalent in the neighbors, breaking ties randomly in the next generation. So that's the first rule. And then the second rule is, well, if the cell is green, then switch it off in the next generation. OK, so one rule saying uh, if you're off uh, and there are green and or blue cells around you, switch on to one of those colors, depending on who, uh, which one is uh, you've got most of in your neighborhood. Uh, if there's a tie, just randomly pick one. Uh, and if you're currently blue or green, then you will switch off in the next generation. Two very simple rules. So uh, based on those rules, uh, what's going to happen to each of these cells in the next generation? So what's going to happen to cell A there? Blue. Yep, cell A, yeah, that's going to go blue because that one's switched off currently. Uh, there is a blue uh, cell within the neighborhood, uh, so that will switch on to being a blue. Uh, what about cell B? Nothing. Yep, that's right, that will remain switched off. There's nothing, there, there are no blue or green cells and it's currently off. Uh, cell C? Switch off. Say that again, sorry. Uh, switch off. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So that one's going to, it's currently green. So that's going to turn off in the next generation. Uh, cell D? Green. green. Yeah, green. So we've got both green and blue in the neighborhood, but there's more green than blue. So that will become uh, green. And then cell E? Either green. Yeah, could, could be one or the other. Be a, a toss of the coin, basically. It will either go blue or, or green. Will D not be blue or green? Because C will be blank. By the uh, time it gets to D, or is it not in, all, in, sequ in a sequence? Yeah, so we'll, we'll so that's a very good point. So, no, in a cellular automaton, the rule uh, would look at this generation. So, if this is that this generation, it okay, so it's green, yeah, now. yeah. It, you raise an interesting point though, because when we come on to agent based simulation next week, um, you'll see uh, how the order in which things move, because in a cellular automaton, we've got these kind of very static rules. In an age-based simulation, you can have things moving around an environment. Um, and of course, that matters, uh, what, what happens first. If you're modeling a disease spread and suddenly someone moves away uh, from somebody who's infected, that's going to have a different outcome. So um, yeah, we'll come back, we'll come back to that. But for cellular automaton, you're just looking at this is that this generation, what will happen in the next generation, assuming this is all remaining. Okay, so. Cellular automata, as I say, can be multidimensional beyond two dimensions. Most uh, cellular automata that you will come across are either uh, one dimensional or two dimensional, as in the example I've just shown you, a two dimensional CA. So in that two dimensional uh, cellular automaton, we've got a, a 2D um, grid of cells. In a one dimensional cellular automaton, basically we have a single row of cells because it's only one dimensional. But we typically visualize that in two dimensions by showing the evolution of the cellular automaton over time using the y-axis, typically starting at the top and then moving down. So gradually we see, okay, in generation one, the, the, the row of cells look like this, then in generation two, it looked like this, then in generation three, it looked like this, etc. So that's typically how you'll see uh, one dimensional cellular automata um, visualized. And we'll see some examples of that in a moment. Okay, so let's talk about a, uh, a little bit more about one dimensional cellular automata because they're, they're quite interesting things, uh, particularly uh, something known as an elementary uh, cellular automaton, which is a special type of uh, one dimensional cellular automaton um, in which there are just two possible states. So unlike my uh, one, which had 
off blue and green. This one's just got two states, zero and one, off and on, if you like. Um, and the state of a cell in the next generation depends only on its own state and that of its two immediate neighbors. OK, that's known as an elementary cellular automaton. It's a one dimensional cellular automaton. Each cell is in one of two possible states. And the state of that cell in the next generation depends only on what state it's in now, um, plus uh, what the states are of its neighbors. Now, if each cellular automaton has got a unique rule set, then there are 256 possible elementary cellular automata. Let's think about why that is. So there are eight possible state configurations for a cell and its immediate neighbors. So if we were described, remember, we, they can only be in a state zero or one. So um, a cell plus its immediate neighbors will give us uh, uh, three different cells, the cell in the middle and the cell to its left and the cell to its right. So there's eight possible combinations of each cell being on or off. You know, 101, 111, where they're all on, 001, where only the right one is on, etc. There's eight of those. In other words, two cubed, two to the power of three, two valid states for each of three cells. Now, each of those eight configurations will output either a zero or a one for the cell in question. In other words, if you've got the setup where you've got an on, off, on, that will result uh, for the middle cell in being um, uh, either on or off. So a unique rule set will specify whether each of the eight configurations will output a zero or one, which gives us two to the eight possible rule sets, where each rule set can be specified by an eight bit, uh, an eight bit array, so an array of eight binary values. Um, so we end up with two to the eight, which is 256 possible cellular, um, elementary cellular automata, okay? Assuming that each one has its own rule set. Now, Stephen Wolfram, uh, who was a computer scientist, uh, who's a big name in cellular automata, particularly in the 80s, um, uh, proposed something called the Wolfram Code, um, which is still used to this day, in which each of those element 256 elementary cellular automata is allocated a number between zero and 255. Remember, we like starting at zero in computer science. Now, you might be thinking, so what, this, this sounds completely uninteresting. Well, turns out some of these rule sets, remember, they are just rules that say a group of three cells is, uh, is either on and off, uh, and um, depending on for each of the eight combinations that it could be, uh, the uh, cell in question will either be on or off in the next generation. So each of those unique rule sets is allocated a number between zero and 255. Some of those rule sets, turns out, just from these very, very incredibly simple rules, have been shown to have very special properties, including generating complex emergent behavior. One rule set, uh, number 110, um, has actually has been shown to be capable of universal computation. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but the, the basic the key message here is these are incredibly simple rules that we've got here. It just says, uh, if this cell is on and then that cell's off and then this cell's on, then the cell is off in the next generation. That's the level of uh, complexity. And yet these things have been shown to have incredibly powerful properties that just these very simple rules exhibit very complex emergent behavior. So we're going to have a little look at uh, a little simulator, an online simulator uh, for a one dimensional cellular automaton. Um, and we're going to check out a couple of the rules, including this rule 110 that is capable of uh, universal computation and also a rule called rule 30. Now, rule 30 is an example of a chaotic cellular automaton, um, one where we get uh, complex and seemingly random patterns just using these very simple, well-defined rules. Um, and because of that, it's been used uh, in random number generation and cryptography and those kind of things where you want that kind of randomness um, or apparent randomness uh, occurring. Um, what's very interesting, we'll, we'll come back to the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the cone snail in a moment. So let's uh, have a look at uh, this link it's going on to here. Um, so you've got all these links in your notes. You're gonna be having a look at these um, in the exercise um, as well. Um, so here we've got a little setup. Uh, we can uh, select which of the uh, 256 rules that we want between 0 and 255. Um, 
and uh, the the size of the cellular automaton. Remember, it's only a one dimensional, so it just specifies how many cells in the row, basically. Um, so let's uh, let's start with twenty and let's run that to the end. Okay, you might be thinking, okay, that's quite interesting. Let's expand that up to a hundred. Let's run that again. Now, isn't that interesting? Something very strange has happened there. We have got very, very simple rules, and yet we've got this very interesting behaviour that's starting to emerge. These little shapes that are that are starting to appear here, just from incredibly simple rules. And if you were to look at that, somebody would show you that that pattern. I don't think you'd imagine that it was uh, it came out as a result of very, very simple rules, particularly as it appears to be uh, both ordered and random. Let's have a look at uh, number 30 as well. So this is the one that's very often used for random number generation. Again, we'll set the size to 100. I'll click run to end. Oh, let's clear it first. Single cell, run to end. And look what happens. There's some really interesting uh, behavior that's that's uh, emerging here. We've got complex emergent behavior, complex patterns um, that seem to be emerging from very simple rules. Let's try putting that up a little bit. There we go. So oh, my computer's wearing up now. Um, but again, so I've put the size up to 500 and we see these, these very interesting patterns starting to emerge. Very, very simple rules. Remember, it's just one of the rule sets that say, if it's in these states, then um uh switch it on if it's if it's not then switch it off yeah we've got this weird stuff that seems to be seems to be happening there now what's really interesting if we go back uh i'll put that back to 100 because it'll be easier to see let's stop uh single cell run to end observe the patterns here observe the patterns here very oddly it seems that Cellular elementary cellular automaton rule number 30 appears to strongly resemble the pattern found on the cone snail conus textile. And we see this time and again with cellular automata, that uh, things that we can't explain uh, using conventional mathematics that we see in the, in the natural world can be explained using cellular automata. This idea that actually these things have emerged through very, very simple individual level dynamics that have just led to something that looks quite complex uh, as an emergent behavior or an emergent pattern in this case. The same with the snowflake. Turns out you can explain formation of a snowflake using cellular automata. Conventional mathematics can't. So that's one type of uh, one dimensional cellular automaton. Um, there, are, there are others as well. So um, let's imagine We've got a one-dimensional cellular automaton that has got a number of states. So we're not restricted by the elementary rules here. Of it must be in one of two states. Uh, we have a number of states, one of which is a dead state, so an off, if you like. And then the rest are different states of being alive. OK. And we've got a neighbourhood of a given size. So unlike an elementary cellular automaton where the neighbourhood is me and my two immediate neighbours, in, uh, let's imagine we've got a cellular automaton where the neighborhood can be of any size. It could be, uh, you know, I've got, uh, it's me plus the three, the three to my left and right. Um, now let's also imagine that this cellular automaton has a rule that says if a cell and its neighbors are dead, then that cell can't come back to life in the next generation. So if, if I'm dead and my neighbor, uh, all the cells in my neighborhood are dead, then I can't come back to life. But beyond this rule, we're going to randomly generate all of the other rules. And we'll have a parameter called lambda that we can adjust. And that probability, uh, sorry, that parameter will represent a probability that one of the randomly generated rules that we come up with will lead to an alive state as opposed to a dead state. So to put that in, in slightly simpler terms, as we adjust lambda towards zero, we'll see more cells dying more quickly because there will be fewer randomly generated rules that will lead to life, to cells becoming alive or sustaining life. Whereas as we uh, tend a lambda towards one, we have more cells that continue living because 
most of the rules that we are randomly generating will lead to cells remaining alive. Okay, so um, it's uh, it's quite sort of theoretical to get your head around, but basically imagine a theoretical cellular automaton. We're rand we, we've got a dead state and then a number of alive states and uh, a neighborhood that can be of any given size. Um, and the only sort of hard and fast rule uh, is that we say if a cell and its neighbors in its neighborhood, whatever that size may be, are dead, then it can't come back to life in the next generation. But beyond that, we're going to randomly generate all the other rules, much as uh, we saw for the elementary cellular automata, where we just say, well, if you've got that combination, then it becomes alive in the next generation. And lambda we're going to use to uh, to switch between as we get towards closer towards zero, more of those randomly generated rules. Um, uh, sorry, fewer of those randomly generated rules will lead to uh, cells remaining alive, whereas as we tend towards one, more of those cells will remain alive. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, there's an abstract concept which is known as uh, the edge of chaos, which describes the points that lie between order and disorder or chaos. And basically what the edge of chaos says is there's within this edge of chaos, within that borderline, there's a great instability because there's this constant interplay between order and disorder. So in cellular automata terms, uh, there was a computer scientist, uh, Christopher Langton, that um, conducted numerous experiments into this concept of the edge of chaos within one-dimensional cellular automata and come up with this idea of this theoretical one-dimensional cellular automata that we could use lambda to describe the, um, uh, the, 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 the level of rules that are leading to life versus leading to death. And what he found is there's this transitional period, this edge of chaos, as we move between generating patterns that are uninteresting because they're very highly ordered to generating patterns that are uninteresting because they're too chaotic. And in the middle, we get this, what we call the edge of chaos, where there is both order and chaos simultaneously. Okay, let's show you order and chaos simultaneously. Why wouldn't you want to see that, frankly? So, uh, we're going to have a look. This again, you've got the, the all of these links. Um, uh, there's various different examples that you can uh, that you can look at here. Uh, I'm just going to show you example one, and I'm going to start. Uh, this will kick off in the wrong place, so I'm just going to put it. Let's imagine. So this is lambda that I'm adjusting on this top bar. So as I go towards the left, uh, you can see lambda decreases, and we said that lambda is basically the probability that rules that are being randomly generated are leading to uh, cells being alive. Um, so uh, in this particular um, uh, randomly generated cellular automaton, we've got eight different states for the cells, a neighborhood of five, um, and uh, there are 16,640 rules, okay? Just randomly generated cellular automaton. Now, as I go towards these lower values, you see not much happens, okay? You get, things die out very quickly. It's not very interesting. If I go right up towards the top, well, We've got more rules leading to life being sustained or created. And so we get this just chaotic pattern, but it's again, it's not particularly interesting. It looks a bit like a magic eye picture. Okay, it's not, not particularly interesting, but something very odd happens when we get to the edge of chaos. And here we start to see both order and disorder within the same uh, the same cellular automata within the same uh, emergent dynamics. And we get these very weird patterns that emerge that are both chaotic and have elements of order to them at the same time. It's very strange. And again, all of this is coming out through these incredibly simple rules. In this case, we've got more states. Uh, we can see them in different colours here. But the principle remains the same. We've just got a number of different states with five neighbors and it'll basically say if you've got this combination uh make that, that that cell this state in the next generation that's all it's doing and yet look at what is happening if you were to show that to someone they would not believe that those simple rules were leading to this incredibly complex behavior and indeed this interplay between both order and chaos Dan, how are things coming back to life on the edges? 
Uh, it's probably it's probably toroidal. Um, so it may be that it's um, and we'll come on to that uh, in a moment. But it, you'll it might be that the rules state that the edge of the uh, uh, the automaton here counts ones over here as its neighbours. In fact, I, I'm almost certain that's what's happening here. Okay. Uh, but yeah, good good point. We'll come on to that. Okay, so um, that's one dimensional cellular automata, which I, I think are beautiful. I could, I, I genuinely could look at that all day. I think it's wonderful. But let's talk a little bit about two D cellular automata, which is probably where some of the more interesting application areas uh, uh, potentially arise. So two D cellular automata share the same principles as one dimensional cellular automata, but of course there are greater possibilities in terms of the network, um, so the neighborhood co uh, configurations. With a one D cellular automata, it's just a size. How 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 many neighbors either side of me? Whereas with a 2D cellular automata, um, we can go in two different directions. And so the two most commonly used neighborhoods that you'll see in two-dimensional cellular automata, uh, this one, the von Neumann neighborhood, uh, where the neighborhood of a cell is defined as the cell plus uh, the immediate neighbors in the four cardinal directions, so north, south, east, and west. Okay, that's a von Neumann neighborhood. Uh, and the other one that you'll commonly use, uh, see used is the Moore neighborhood, which is the one we saw earlier, um, which is the neighborhood of a cell is um, the cell itself plus all of its uh, surrounding cells. Okay, They are by far the, the, the two most commonly used neighborhood types within um, two-dimensional cellular automata. Now, probably the most famous of all of the two-dimensional cellular automata, in fact, of any of the uh, cellular automata, it's probably uh, John Conway's uh, Game of Life. Uh, you may have come across this before. Sometimes it's referred to simply as Life or the Game of Life. Uh, and as I say, it was devised by the mathematician John Conway. Now, Life is um, a 2D cellular automaton in which each cell can be in one of two states, alive or dead. So we're back to our sort of binary states. You're either alive or you're dead. And it uses a more neighborhood, which is the one where it's all of the surrounding cells. And all life has is four very simple rules. These are the rules. First rule, if a cell is alive and it has fewer than two alive neighbors, then that cell will die in the next generation. And this is used to uh, emulate underpopulation. Okay. If a cell is alive, and has two or three alive neighbors, then the cell will continue to live on in the next generation. The third rule says if a cell is alive and has more than three alive neighbors, then it will die in the next generation, this time through overpopulation. And the fourth rule says if a cell is dead and has exactly three alive neighbors, uh, the cell will become born, become alive in the next generation through um, a rather odd reproduction. Okay, so those four very simple rules, that's the entire game of life. Basically, if you're alive, you want exactly two or three neighbours, any fewer than two, and you'll die through underpopulation, uh, more than three, and you'll die through overpopulation. But if you're dead, you need three alive neighbours. That's it. That's the entire extent of uh, the rules to the game of life. So what's going to happen to these cells in the game of life in the next generation? Cell A, what's going to happen there? Die. Yeah, cell A, it's going to be uh, dying through underpopulation. Uh, cell B? It's going to die. Yeah, B's going to, B's a goner too. That's got too many neighbours, too many neighbours there, so that's going to die as well. Uh, C? It's fine. Yeah, C's fine. We've got three neighbours. That's OK. Uh, D? Uh, it's also fine. Well, it'll become born. Uh, so D is dead. Oh, right. It, yeah, sorry. It will become alive because uh, these three cells will reproduce. And cell E? It won't be born. No. Cell E will continue to be dead. OK. So we can see that very, very simple rules. Four very simple rules that we can apply to any cell within our 2D cellular automaton. But it turns out that just from these very, very simple rules, we get this incredibly complex behavior emerging 
so much so that we actually see patterns or, or referred to as very often as life forms that have been found uh, to emerge when we play the game of life. And in fact, we see different categories of life forms that people have found. There are things known as still lifes. These are patterns that don't change from one generation to the next. They remain still. We've got things called oscillators, which are patterns that repeat after a certain number of generations, which we refer to as the pattern, uh, sorry, the period. Um, and uh, spaceships, which are patterns or life forms that move themselves across a grid. So before we have a look at that in a bit more detail, let's have a look at um, the, uh, the game of life in action. So there's a couple of links that we're uh, going to look at. Uh, so let, let's, let's uh, pause that on there. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is uh, the game. This is the first link. This is the default shape that we started with. Uh, here we've got our yellow cells represent cells that are alive. And gray cells represent ones that are dead. Let's start this playing. We appear to have some sort of life form that is moving its way across the grid in a southeasterly direction. All we've done is apply those very four, uh, very simple four um, uh, simple rules. And we've got this. And in fact, it turns out there's quite a few of these. So if we click on lexicon, there are loads of these different shapes that we can see uh, emerge. And you can have a look at any of these. So this is known as the 180 degree kickback. Let's click on that, it'll set that up. Click start, all this is doing is it's applying uh, those simple game of life rules. And there we go. Now we've got this life form that seems to be transporting up, seems to have destroyed the other one, and now it's moving its way over here. And in fact, you can play around with all sorts of stuff here. Um, so uh, let me just clear this screen uh, and bear with me two seconds while I redraw this pattern. So this is a pattern that I came across um, just randomly, randomly drawing stuff. Uh, but it turns out uh, shows quite a few things that I wanted to, uh, to show you. Uh, so you can recreate this pattern yourself and uh, I'll try and find your own patterns even better. Uh, that one there. Okay, that's just a random pattern that I drew. Let's click start. Okay, so we've got a life form that seems to uh, have caused a bit of disruption here and is now disappearing off over here. We had uh, a still life form that uh, uh, got interacted with and then everything else has died and all we're left with is one of these, which is known as a type of spaceship. And one of these, which is an oscillator, where we've got this same pattern blinking back left, back right. Just because I drew that very simple pattern. And we got this really interesting, complex behavior emerge. And it turns out what's really interesting about the game of life is that these kinds of patterns keep coming out from, uh, from our various random patterns. They keep emerging. Uh, we'll also have a look at this uh, other link here, if I can get rid of the Zoom thing, there we go. Um, so in this one, uh, you can uh, look at various different uh, uh, pre-made ones here. So this is a toroidal world, so uh, things that come off one side, a bit like Pac-Man, sort of uh, re-emerge the other side. Um, so here we've got a, a very interesting one where we appear to have things going back, left, back, right, and shooting things off down here. How weird is that? That's just those same simple rules. Um, let's have a look at partial queen bee loop. Look at that. Extraordinary. Again, just from these really simple rules. The rules are exactly the same every time. All we are changing is the starting pattern. That's it. And yet we get these uh, consistent life forms that seem to be uh, emerging. Let's have a look at the spaceship. There we go. Spaceships off across the galaxy. We didn't create that, we just created a, a set of four incredibly simple rules. So simple we can we can manually work them out within seconds. Yet we didn't anticipate this. So let's talk a little bit about these, these three categories of patterns. Um, there are lots of different patterns that you'll find out there, but here are some of the common ones that you'll uh, tend to see emerge. So uh, the first category is still lifes. Uh, so we saw an example of a couple of these still lifes um, uh, patterns within uh, the example I just show, uh, showed you. Um, so a still life pattern doesn't change from one generation to the next. It's known as a stable pattern. Um, common ones you'll see are the block, which we saw a little bit of. 
Uh, the beehive, which we saw a glimpse of as well before it was destroyed by another life form. And loaf, uh, which you also see uh, quite commonly as well. And if you think about it, if we look at these patterns, we can see why they don't change from one generation to the next. In the block, this cell is alive, has exactly three neighbours. It will continue to be alive, and that will apply for each of those four. But none of the surrounding cells out here uh, have uh, exactly um, uh, exactly three neighbours in order to become alive again. So we have that static pattern. And you can trace this through for all, each of the patterns. We can see why they are still life. Then we've got oscillators. We saw some uh, an example of an oscillator. Um, uh, so an oscillator pattern repeats after a certain number of generations, which is known as the period of the pattern. A couple of the most common, the blinker is incredibly common. You will see this a lot. We just saw that a moment ago. Um, this pattern, which oscillates from being uh, three uh, vertical, sorry, three horizontal uh, cells being alive to three vertical cells being alive to three horizontal, and it just keeps repeating. So it's got a period of two. Uh, it repeats after two generations. It goes back to its original state. Uh, we've also got a pulsar. You'll see these quite commonly as well. Um, this one's got a period of three. It repeats after three generations. And we get this fantastic, beautiful pattern that emerges and just keeps repeating. And these things will just continue unless, as we saw examples of, uh, another life form interacts with them in some way. Then we've got these things called spaceships. So spaceships are patterns that move themselves across the grid via a pattern that repeats after a certain period, but in a different location. So they're a bit like an oscillator that moves location. And by far the most common type of spaceship you'll see is the glider, um, which is the one we just saw uh, uh, numerous times in, in those uh, different patterns, um, flying off, usually causing some destruction, and then flying off uh, to, uh, to leave them to it. Uh, so what's the period of this particular spaceship? Five? Nope. Close, though. Four. Yeah, four. So it's it goes through four iterations before the repeat. But the difference with a spaceship is that the repeat, uh, unlike an oscillator, where the repeat would uh, have this exactly the same cells that are then uh, um, uh, become, uh, uh, go back to their original states, revert back. With a spaceship, th that original shape is displaced. So we've got the same pattern, but it's moved down a bit and to the right a bit. Um, we've also got these things called um, eaters. I love eaters. So eaters are these still life patterns that they don't move. But when other life forms come in, uh, they appear to consume them without suffering any damage themselves. And once they've consumed it, they go back to their original pattern. Uh, these are fascinating little things. Uh, let's have a look at uh, an example here of an eater. Uh, so this is an eater pattern. Uh, this is the eater here. We can see there's a, a glider spaceship that's coming in uh, from the top left here. So let's uh, watch what happens. So the glider is coming in. It's being consumed by the eater pattern before the eater pattern gradually goes back to exactly how it was. And it's gone back to being a still life again. Fascinating. And we see these, these uh, bizarre life forms uh, that emerge. So unlike a lot of still life patterns will be um, destroyed in some way or create new life forms as other life forms interact with them. Now, these patterns uh, continue to be discovered even to this day. There's actually an annual contest called the Pattern of the Year contest uh, in which uh, people submit interesting patterns that they've discovered uh, within the game of life and those submissions are judged. Um, there's a little link there you can go and have a look at what the patterns of the year have been uh, for the last few years and if you get really interested in this kind of stuff maybe even you'll find some patterns yourself. Um, it's quite it, 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 it can be quite mesmerizing uh, uh, some of this stuff. But I hear, you, I hear you cry. Okay this is all very interesting Dan so, but why should we care about any of this? Well other than the fact I think is interesting and I think it's good to uh, explore stuff that's interesting patterns, these fat, the fact that these patterns emerge, these uh, uh, life forms, apparent life forms emerge from very, very simple um, rules in the game of life, demonstrate perfectly this concept of 
not just emergent, but self-organizing behavior emerging at a population or a system level, just from very, very simple rules being applied at the individual level. We can see how simple those four Game of Life rules are, and yet they create these life forms that are still being discovered to this day, uh, and these very interesting complex emergent patterns just through those very four simple rules. It also demonstrates how order can emerge from what we can see as chaos. And indeed, if we were to use a cellular automaton to represent a real world system, those kinds of patterns might help us understand certain types of emergent behavior that might be where we need to design interventions uh, to either encourage that or uh, mitigate against it in some way. Okay. So the key message I want to give you about all of this is that um, the, the, the core principle behind agent-based simulation of all types, including cellular automaton, is that uh, complex emergent behavior can emerge uh, at a system level, a population level, through very simple individual level rules. And if you can think about behavioral systems that uh, look at very simple rules of thumb at an individual level you might be able to create an agent-based simulation or even a, a cellular automaton perhaps that describes that kind of system where you've just got a very simple in individual level things that are happening but then we see this, these really interesting uh, behavioral dynamics at a population scale or a system level okay so here's your task so next week you're going to we're going to go into uh, agent-based simulation uh, more widely, and you're going to uh, get a chance to use a fantastic package called Mesa, um, which allows you to build. Uh, it's really easy to use. Um, it just uses object-oriented code, um, so it's good practice for your object-oriented programming, um, but it's actually really simple to use. Uh, and you'll see with an agent-based simulation more generally, you can get them to do anything. OK, so you're not restricted by having rule sets or, um, you know, you can get them and say, well, uh, I've got a here's my grid, uh, uh, here's my environment, uh, here are my agents. Those agents can have very complex rules. Indeed, my um, uh, bumblebees in my PhD were using reinforcement learning algorithms, AI algorithms within each agent. So but for now, we're just talking about cellular automata, which are these uh, sort of very, very pure um, uh, eight types of agent based simulation that have these uh, more sort of abstract, but very simple grid based rules. So, what I want you to do, um, first of all, we're going to have a, a 10 minute break. And then you're going to work into your groups uh, until about four o'clock. And what I want you to do, first of all, is have a little play, uh, a mini play with the, the stuff that I've shown you. So, um, have a play with the 1D elementary cell automata stuff that I showed you in, the, in these links here. Uh, have a look at the edge of chaos and, and uh, get as mesmerized as I do by just watching these wonderful little patterns. Uh, you can play with the game of life um, in these in these links here uh, as well. Uh, have another link. There's an extra link that I put in here as well, um, which uh, looks at some other uh, uh, 2D cellular automata. So game life is by far the biggest, but there are others. Uh, Star Wars is a particularly cool one. Uh, that, and you'll see why it's called Star Wars when you click on that link and click Star Wars. It's, it's really quite an apt name uh, for it. Uh, so have a little bit of a play around, give yourself a chance within your groups, have a play around and, and uh, have somebody share the screen and try different things out. But then what I want you to do, once you've had a bit of a play around, is as a group, I want you to come up with a design for a cellular automaton that could represent a real world problem. OK, so this is really going to test your ability to think about um, a real world problem and how to abstract it into uh, a, a more sort of abstract framework. So uh, I'd recommend you start by sort of talking about some potential application areas where you think uh, this kind of approach could, could potentially help. And then when you've come up with um, uh, some ideas, pick one of them, and then you're going to work up a design for that cellular automaton. You don't have to build it, don't worry. Um, you will next week, not this, but uh, you will build an uh, agent-based simulation next week. But actually, you'll see that's quite easy as well. But for now, you're just going to design one. OK, um, so I want you to think about when you're designing this, what your grid will represent. What does the grid represent in terms of your real world problem? What's the dimension uh, dimensionality of your grid going to be? Is it going to be one dimensional, two dimensional, 36 dimensional? 
be a bit careful. That might be a bit complex. Think about how many states you're going to have and what those individual states will represent. What kind of neighbourhood will you use uh, for your uh, automaton? And think about what rules you'll use. So what will be the rules for your cellular automaton? Remember, the key with a cellular automaton is very simple rules that lead to very complex emergent behaviour. So think about what in the real world can you distill down into simple rules of thumb? So I talked about with my um, uh, uh, PhD work on, with the bees, admittedly that wasn't using cellular automaton, that was using agent-based simulation more generally. Um, but it was pretty simple in terms of the rules. It was, wh where do I think, go to go to patch that has, uh, you know, highest uh, perceived level of uh, food, then it would use a reinforcement learning algorithm, say, sample the food, if, if, uh, if get food, then think this patch is better. Now, obviously, with a cellular automaton, there, you're talking even more simple, but again, you're distilling stuff down to very simple rules. How can you represent complex behavior, but in a very, in a very simple way? And think about what questions you want your cellular automaton to answer and how that potentially might be used. And I'm hoping, you never know, that one of these uh, ideas may even turn into an actual real world HSMA project. You never know. I'm, I think it's more likely that might happen after next week's session, but I'd be equally delighted to see a, a, a cellular automaton uh, idea come forward. I think that'd be really cool. Remember, these things have been used to model the spread of crime. They've been used to model um, uh, traffic jams. And we had some really interesting ideas come out uh, when we ran this exercise last year as well. So what's going to happen, we're, you're going to run this tool uh, to about four o'clock-ish. Uh, I'll see how you're getting on. I may give you a little bit longer depending on what's happening. Um, but uh, you're then going to come back and um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, each of you, each of the groups to present your idea, uh, uh, present the design for your cellular automaton. So you want to um, have somewhere to, to note these things down, maybe draw some stuff. Uh, I'll ask you each to uh, present, each group to present, and um, then I'm going to ask Elliot to uh, judge which one's the best. Uh, so we're going to have a little bit of a competitive element uh, this afternoon too, okay? So think creatively and have some real fun uh, with this kind of stuff. But go and stretch your legs for 10 minutes first um, and then have a play around with this stuff, get inspired, and then come up with some ideas for cellular automata. Okay, any questions about any of that? Uh, if there are, my Zoom has just crashed, so bear with me two seconds. Second time today. Sorry, I will just close that then and reopen. Hello, sorry about that. Clearly Zoom uh, uh, didn't like cellular automata today. Yeah, sorry, any questions about any of that? So is it more like a, a system dynamic field we are entering into? Um, sort of, um, a little bit like that, but in some ways agent-based simulation is the also the opposite to system dynamics. So system dynamics is very much about I'm going to zoom right out and look at my system in terms of what are the dynamics of the system, how they interact with each other. Whereas an agent-based simulation zooms right in and says, okay, I think the system is made up of individuals. They may be living beings or they may be organizations that are, but usually they will be some sort of living being that is interacting and behaving in certain ways. And if I can model those individual level behaviors, I can then zoom out again and see what happens uh, when I look at a population of, uh, of them interacting together. That's that's kind of the key difference. Thank you. Any other questions, sorry? Yeah, I have one. Uh, is it limited to just the one generation? So it has no memory. It's only, though I guess you could create a dimension that remembers the previous one or something like that. Yeah, so um, so that raises a good point. So for a cellular automata, you don't have memory at all. It literally, it's this generation now, this will now happen, there's no memory at all. For an agent-based simulation more generally, then yes, you can easily create the memory. And in fact, 
you when we come on to modeling the the disease spread next week you'll see it exactly has that that each agent will then retain a okay i was infected three days ago i've got another seven days before i before i'm no longer infectious or whatever so you, you will have that in more general terms but in cilia automata which is a particular subset of agent-based simulation uh it's far more restrictive in, so for an agent-based simulation generally you can do anything literally anything um whereas with a, a cellular a cellular automata um you're you're looking at um these kind of very simple generational level rules so it, it, it's a little bit more restricted in terms of that okay any other questions sorry can you can you give us uh, examples like we are agent-based simulation will be suitable and not system dynamics and or one or the other. I mean, like there, there will be situation where system dynamics will be the more suitable one and not the agent-based one or, um, or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, there's not, obviously we haven't covered a system dynamics yet. So um, the potential that, that, that could confuse. And the other thing is that, um, a lot of a lot of choice of modeling approach is very is mostly down to the modeler so a lot of um uh and we've had this kind of discussion amongst colleagues that you can you can have these kind of general rules but you can you can try and do most things in anything um i think some things fit better um but te you tend to find that people gravitate towards the stuff they like the most but in general terms, you're looking at if you're if you're interested in modeling the behavior of individuals within a system, and it's that behavior you're interested in, then you would tend to go to agent-based simulation because you're looking at the individual level rules creating an emergent dynamic. Whereas with system dynamics, you're saying uh, you're zooming right out and you're saying these components, these parts of a system influence each other in these ways. In a, in a, and it's very high level. So it talks about, you know, um, this, uh, as this thing happens, this thing gets increased. Okay, that's quite different to uh, individual level um, uh, interactions and behaviors. So it depends which level you're, you're zooming in on. But um, I mean, my, I should also say, I don't like system dynamics. <laughs> so my, my honest answer, I'm trying not to say is don't, uh, yeah, don't, use system dynamics but that's just my own personal preference and yes i'm aware i'm teaching you system dynamics um uh i i get why people like it. i just think there's a lot of bad sd models out there um but anyway uh the, the generally speaking if you're looking if it's the behaviors individual level behaviors that are the thing that's likely of interest and that you're trying to model i would go to more towards an agent-based simulation uh rather than a, a system dynamics type thing um so uh a lot of the um uh, disease spread is a good example because it the in that case you're thinking of okay individuals are behaving and moving and interacting uh, and it's those behaviors and movements and interactions that are happening because of individuals making individual decisions that are then um, uh, leading to these complex emergent dynamics um but there are no hard and fast rules other than you have to sort of you know uh certain if you've got a queuing problem you probably want a discrete event simulation but again i've seen people do it in system dynamics as well um but there are things that they are better suited towards yeah and there are loads of people who are doing system dynamic but um, agent-based simulation is not that prevalent so what do you think what, what's the reason for that like i haven't seen like many in you know agent-based well, simulation like I mean, it, it depends on the sector i mean uh agent-based simulation has been around for for decades and is hugely used and say in, eco in ecology you talk about modeling and they mean agent-based simulation or individual-based modeling they call it but um that's what they mean it's synonymous that's how you model in ecology um so it depends on the sector in operational research um it has not been as widely used um but uh there are and, and part of that is likely because if i'm honest operational research has been dragging its feet and focused on discrete event simulation primarily for a long time um but uh, I, I think there is a lot of scope, particularly with things like reinforcement learning gaining ground now, um, the, the being able to combine aspects of things like reinforcement learning with 
um, uh, individual agents in acting on those things can be quite powerful. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure I'd agree that, that, that it's, it depends on the sector. Um, Agent-based simulation is hugely used uh, in a lot of things, but um, uh, in operational research, it's probably uh, historically been underused, I would say. Sorry, Jack, I just want to chip in. Is, 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 is this also what is used in climate modeling? Um, so it, I, I mean, I don't know about climate modeling, so it might, it, it may well be. Um, so you can, uh, your agents don't necessarily have to be um, uh, people. They can represent uh, more abstract concepts in, in proper agent-based simulation anyway. Um, so you could have, um, so for example, I've, I've seen um, agent-based simulations that have looked at, um, uh, years ago, I saw one that was looking at, um, the way in which uh, clinicians are influenced uh, by uh, certain drug manufacturers um, in order to um, yeah, prescribe certain drugs, and that leads to um, various uh, individual level interactions amongst patients. We did a piece of work um, oh, a long time ago now, about six, seven years ago, looking at polypharmacy, so where you're prescribing multiple medications uh, for patients with multiple conditions and with the problem that a lot of the times that causes adverse reactions and frankly your patients often don't take what the medication is prescribed and so using that individual level uh, behavioral modeling to try and work out if there are better ways in which you can um, prescribe that may be less clinically effective but if they, it means that the patient would end up taking their medication um, then might actually be more effective overall. So um, uh, there are certainly things like that. Climate modeling, I don't know offhand. I'm not, I, I'm not aware of that sector, the, the sort of things they use. So. Uh, I don't. It, it, it is widely used in um, economics, especially like when you're modeling things like incentives and disincentives and try to uh, kind of forecast what unintended consequences. Yeah. Uh, it is widely used. And uh, in very, I mean, very good come, uh, results come out of it, or agent based models. Yeah, it's it's um, yeah, that's a really good point. I think it's um, it, it is very much it's it's one of those modeling methods that either gets sort of extensively used or, or largely ignored, depending on your sector. That's certainly been my experience of it. Um, uh, it's quite big in computer science as a thing, um, and it, as I say, it's huge in ecology, and as you say, in economics, that it's a big thing. But you know. I, when I when I came into operational research, you'd you'd get funny looks every time I'd mention agent based simulation, um, because they'd just say, "Well, it's just a queuing model. Just think about things in terms of queuing models." But um, it's amazing how these things emerge. Um, anyway, I I, I I will move us on because we could probably spend all day debating the, the merits. But um, this will be a good exercise actually to to really uh, flash out some of those thoughts and and see if you can think of a. Uh, uh, an agent-based simulation come up with a design for an agent-based, uh, sorry, cellular automata, very specifically, um, that, uh, uh, that that kind of uh, makes you think in a slightly abstract way, but also constrains uh, that abstract thinking uh, into a cellular automata type world. Um, okay, go and have a break for 10 minutes, uh, and I will open up the breakout rooms now, um, and uh, I'll float around and look forward to hearing your ideas around four o'clock. Hi everyone. Okay, so uh, welcome back. Um, so, uh, had a chance to uh, to figure out most of the groups. I think uh, listening in, some interesting ideas um, coming out. Um, this is not actually, although it's not technically challenging, um, it's uh, not a particularly easy task. Um, this one because uh, we've essentially asked you to think in a in a very different way to the way you're used to thinking, and that's really the challenge here. Um, that uh, so far we've been very much talking in terms of thinking about um, uh, processes and systems and how those uh, things happen to people. Whereas this kind of modeling requires you to think about um, the behaviors as being the, 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 the kind of centerpiece, the focus uh, for what you're trying to model. Um, so it's a very different uh, kind of way of thinking, but it's a very important uh, way of thinking where you're trying to model behavior now, you'll find next week it'll be a little bit easier because um, we'll look, A, we'll look at a practical example of 
uh, uh, a more general agent-based simulation where we're not um, limited by the uh, restrictions of a cellular automaton. Um, uh, and you'll see how to build that uh, in in uh, a package called Mesa, which is really nice. Um, so you get you get a chance to actually build this stuff um, as well. Um, but also, it's it's uh, um, uh, the challenge with something like this is your. So I heard a lot of groups, you know, talking about things like um, can we simulate probabilities and stuff. Well, in an agent based simulation, yes, you absolutely can. Um, and so uh, you'll see that next week. You'll see examples where we we will we'll build a little uh, disease spread model, and people will move around a little grid, and they have a probability that they are infected at the start. And then if they move into if they're infected, and they move into the same location as another um, agent. They might then infect them, um, and they have a probability that they will move at any time step. So you can capture those more complex uh, behavioral dynamics, but with a cellular automaton, obviously it's much more restrictive. You're thinking very, very uh, simple and abstract terms. Um, but nonetheless, they can be quite powerful. And we've kind of done this deliberately to try and get you initially thinking in a more um, uh, high level kind of way about how you would abstract behaviors to simple rules of thumb. Um, and so the, the main purpose of this afternoon really is to get you uh, uh, your brain sort of working in that uh, transitional way where you're you're starting to think less about uh, IQ for this thing and then this thing happens and then I go off in one of these directions to uh, we know that individuals behave in the, these ways how can we um, describe those behaviors using uh, very simple rules um, that will lead to complex um, emergent dynamics. So um, it's quite a challenging task, um, but interesting to see what uh, uh, people have uh, come up with. So uh, we're gonna ask each group now um, to uh, present and I'm gonna ask um, Elliot to uh, judge a winner for us um, uh, uh, for uh, for this uh, particular exercise. So uh, we'll go through it in order. So um, if we can start with um, Acorn Archimedes, somebody from the group want to uh, uh, present what you came up with as your cellular automaton. Um, we kind of had a, a list of ideas kind of um, what about hospital admissions, uh, the chance of admission based on statistics in the area, um, age, obesity, IMD rank, and the chance of readmission. Um, other things like workforce planning, so the numbers of uh, nurses needed and the outflow of uh, nurses based on the hospital on the uh, other nurses working with them, the low staff level, high staff levels, things like that. Um, modeling flu in care homes, um, how it's spread between them, um, and the kind of mortality and the kind of the flu dying out eventually. Um, we thought about uh, departments in a hospital and the stock levels between them. So not individual items, but um the actual stock level itself and what would happen if we start to go down the impact on other departments and how much disruption um also vacancies in a region and how that was governed by um, pay differences house prices and things like that so the model the flow of people in and out uh, that's roughly what we have thank you Okay, great. Thanks. So you had a, a number of ideas there. Did you have any sort of thoughts on on um, for any of those? Whether you know how you might express those in terms of uh, uh, simple rules, different states, neighbourhoods, that sort of thing. Um, well, with kind of um, staff retention, we were thinking that um, the chance of someone leaving would be based on the amount of other people working in the department and having other low staff departments in the same hospital would cause people to be more likely to leave. So yeah, something I, like that. I think that could make a really nice um, uh, agent-based simulation generally, actually, that, that, that could be an interesting use and probably uh, you might need something beyond the shackles of cellular automaton, but as a more general agent-based simulation, I think that, that could be a really interesting one uh, and quite a timely one actually to, to, to use. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Amiga 500, uh, somebody want to present what you came up with? Hi, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time discussing how our brains don't work in these particularly abstract ways. And um, we, uh, 
we, we talked about whether you could use it for the observed behaviors and like so if you like that indirect peer pressure about use of hand gels in in the hospital and um another one we talked about was uh, you know uh, word of mouth spread and you know say awareness of the service you know is you know are they aware of the service are they not are they aware and happy aware and unhappy and how that would spread but in terms of actually sort of talking something through, we did settle very much on like an infectious disease, you know, you know, our background and what we know, sort of epidemiology of, of looking at that infected, yes, no, or immune. And then, um, you know, if you're infected, 50% people, you know, if there's more than half the people around you, they become infected. Um, uh, for the next generation if you're infected you'd switch off in two generations and you'd remain Im immune for say two generations um so yeah that was sort of what we ended up talking through as a as sort of a worked idea around other examples that we'd had great no i think i mean certainly cellular automata would be a, a really good fit for that and that leads nicely into into what i say what we'll be doing next week where we will uh, develop such a, a disease spread model, um, uh, albeit you know, say without the shackles of the uh, uh, restrictions of uh, uh, cellular automata, but um, uh, actually modelling the way in which people move and and, and spread and how that can uh, uh, we can monitor that um, over time. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, Amstrad CPC. Hi. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, we were talking about, um, we talked about a few things. So we talked about, um, uh, there were two, two things, kind of uh, migration drivers. And then we also talked about um, whether or not people uh, kind of movements into, into beds and those kind of things. But um, we decided that we stuck on the migration factor. We talked about push factors and the things that you might put in dimensions uh, that would maybe push a person to move from their physical location. And then we kind of, well, that kind of, they typically kind of descend into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you can describe this quite neatly. And then we thought, well, if we kind of split the grid up into, we describe the kind of geographical prevalence of how well these needs are met and kind of just split it along kind of coordinates. Um, you could then maybe kind of summarize um, what, what, whether or not a paid person would want to stay in an area by having um, a high score or uh, wanting to go to an area where they had a low score. Um, and so we kind of kind of came up with a grid might look like this. That, so you might, an area um, that was kind of, these people on the edge might try to move up here and these would be eaters and they, these would just absorb the areas um and um but you know they would this area here would stay populated as would this area here um but you also wouldn't want to if you want to kind of a barrier to migration would be like a physical barrier so here's the here's a here's a big c and here's another big c uh which people you wouldn't go across between those two areas because it wouldn't be feasible and then we kind of, well, if you want another pu a push would be about whether or not other people around you are moving. So if people around you turned off because they moved, then you might move, be more likely to move. But we want to kind of represent different factors. So you'd have your hierarchy of needs, but also like this, what society is doing around you. Um, and that became quite a bit, bit of a kind of, we got a bit um, down the rabbit hole with that. Um, so then try to kind of dig ourselves back out and just make it really simple. Um, so um, some rules that we came up with, so if a cell is lit, um, so a cell is lit if they're remaining and off if they're moving. So th I've got it the wrong way around here, but black cells are lit and, uh, and white cells are moving. And then, so two unlit cells around you encourages a person to move. The move decision is impacted by geographical dimensions, but also by pull factors of other locations. Um, and so kind of this, this is what we might start with and then this is what that might become um so you'd see kind of these areas would eat uh migration from these areas um and then um we thought that maybe some of the benefits this might be to describe areas where um you could invest to kind of improve the provision for hierarchy of needs 
or how quickly migration might occur. So I think if you kind of factored in kind of environmental factors, uh, sea level rises, which would be another factor that might push people to exit an area, um, then that would be useful. Uh, things we would might want to add might be uh, kind of these highly prosperous areas might um, they would need a, a high death rate and a low birth rate because that's a kind of feature of prosperity is the low birth rates and aging population. But then the areas where there's lower prosperity, you would need to have a high birth rate, which is the other, other kind of push factor. Um, and so that's kind of where we got with that. It was quite a, a brain ache. Brilliant. I, I think that's really, really good. I, I, I love the way you've um, really uh, uh, thought that through and, and tried to um, sort of take those uh, sort of complex factors and distill that down um, in, into these uh, kind of heuristics that can be represented in that kind of cellular automaton structure. I think that's really nice. Um, uh, and uh, I could I could see a project from that. I could uh, that, that's a really interesting uh, expression of those things. And it almost looked as though you got some uh uh, uh I've misunderstood some um sort of multi uh the start you talked about sort of different cellular with with the kind of summary so all of those things interplaying into yeah so we thought like you know the kind of north the north north eastern north and the central north areas would have high degrees of psychological and security and and social needs all being met with the steam and self-actualization all being fine but then areas in the kind of the central and south would have low um but that wouldn't be such a factor but we also thought about well actually there might be areas where um there are kind of there's good community and good security and uh, but the society is is tricky uh so you maybe don't have as much freedom of expression um and your self-actualization might not be as feasible but uh, your esteem and psychological and security are kind of catered by kind of more authoritarian states. So try to bring that into it. And also like, you know, you might not able to, you might not be able to leave or have access to information about leaving. So, uh, you know, the dimensionality made our heads hurt a little bit, but I th we thought that basically an individual would have a stack of factors that, yeah. would, that, it would need, that would need to kind of push it out of its location. Well, you, yeah, um, I'm just thinking you could you could um, have it so that you. Uh, I, I just thought of this as you as you were sort of describing that you could have, essentially, a stack of cellular automata that represented different aspects that then played into that individual's kind of final state. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, and, and you know, have that. So you've got cellular automata, which is representing different push pull factors that then determine whether they that the cellular automaton which represents you know their movement um, yeah we didn't get to kind of we didn't kind of think further on these things but we thought about push factors and jen was describing neatly around kind of some of the factors that might make a country aspirational to go to so family and opportunities and security and freedom but things that, that would make a transit country less likely for someone to stay in so the res the negative reception you might receive there or the economic situation might not be as preferable as a pull destination um and um and then obviously family being a, a key factor and she, we also kind of kind of thought about what the hierarchy of needs kind of splits out into kind of like human rights or um economic um prosperity and it, kind of like these these three kind of kind of fit the human rights kind of needs to move whereas these two meet the kind of economic needs um and probably is kind of about probably matches kind of well with um, um, applications for immigration. No, I think that's fascinating. That's re really interesting. And you could even imagine uh, you could play around with uh, weightings of different cellular automata that factor into that that move i think that's really you could you could get a project out of that i could see a project emerging from that that's uh really interesting brilliant thank you very much that was uh really really well thought out really uh a perfect demonstration of uh, sort of taking that sort of complex thing and thinking about how you'd represent that that, that kind of complex behavior cool thanks brilliant thank you uh okay so next up we've got uh, apple macintosh Okay, we, we 
um, explored a number of ideas. We looked at um, um, various things about uh, cancer uh, spread, et cetera, those kind of easy hit ones. And then we started looking at vaccine denial as the domain we wanted to focus on. Um, so this is um, the kind of influence of um, individuals on people um, prescribing to vaccinations. So we looked at a TUD cellular automata um, as the um, as the cellular model we'd use. Um, so there are a number of states there. So we we simplified it down to we'd have deniers, agnostics, and believers uh, as our states. Um, we did talk later on about maybe we'd expand that potentially. You could have other states of vaccinated and unvaccinated. Um, to add into the, into the different states, but we stuck with these three initially, um, using a more neighbourhood. Um, so those surrounding the um, the individual state would be influences on that state. Um, decided to be a startup state, so agnostics are off by default, um, and uh, we'd introduce a capability of understanding it from different densities. So we could have densities based around high densities on denial or high densities on belief or vice versa. Um, the rules we looked at were a greater number of denial in neighborhood than an agnostic would become a denier, a greater number of beliefs in the neighborhood um, than, uh, sorry, a greater number of believers in the neighborhood than an agnostic would become a believer. Believers become agnostic if a denier is greater than five in the neighborhood. And then we weighted the um, state of more deniers in the neighborhood and deniers become agnostic if belief is greater than seven in the neighborhood. Um, and then we talked around what the outcomes of that would be, what the questions we're actually looking to answer. Um, two of the main ones was um, what would be the optimum to achieve population of believers and should the target intervention at uh, should you target intervention at deniers or agnostics you know really interesting really interesting that i think that's really again a really nice uh use of um uh, cellular automata i can see that uh again uh, playing into a, a really nice representation of that i like the way as well you've um sort of thought about the kind of weighting that actually you know it might be more difficult to bring a denier back to agnostic than to get a believer to agnostic um and you could even play around with that uh to see how those yeah. dynamics change as well um I, I liked the thing that you mentioned as well you know about potentially expanding that to think about uh as well as the beliefs having uh um so you could have additional states thinking are uh, people who are believers who have been vaccinated as well um and whether uh and, and that's the sort of thing that you know you could get sort of uh, uh rough data to kind of indicate what your rules might look like um uh to say that you know people who are who are influenced in their networks um yeah it was it was interesting from a viewpoint of just looking at the recent with covid over the past couple of years and people's viewpoint and how people are influenced um from one way from you know deniers believers or to agnostics but if you then just put into the mix about vaccinations unvaccinated then we're in that kind of limbo area where we we may have been agnostic but we became believers and we were vaccinated but now we're kind of more agnostic and we're not really pursuing booster injections and things like that at this point in time potentially yeah no absolutely no again i really see that i can see that as a project in itself that'd be really uh really fascinating um no really well done fantastic yes thank you really interesting fantastic okay so uh next up we've got atari 800 yeah, I hope it's okay. I speak uh, for us. Um, so uh, we were speaking about the way ideas are propagated across an organization or how decisions are made. And we discussed a little bit about how, you know, what sort of dimensions we might look at. And we said, well, it could be seniority of the person or the or whether they're male or female, which made us laugh but not really um and uh and and other things but i i'm afraid we didn't get very much further than that but just that it might be a a good way of modeling things like that yeah no absolutely and you're absolutely right i mean it's interesting you've picked up on that so the um that kind of uh, what we call a diffusion model 
um, is, is quite often used. They quite often use um, agent-based simulations where it is the kind of um, the spread of ideas. So rather than the spread of you know an infectious disease, it becomes uh, the spread of ideas, and that might be both positive and negative. Very similar actually to what we what we've just seen in the uh, in, in the uh, sort of vaccine and uh, COVID denier and uh, that kind of exactly. that diffusion mm -hmm. of ideas. I think um, that that's a really that's a uh, it's an interesting way in which you you're sort of modelling. Um, the beha the behavioural dynamic is the core element there, uh, and the way in which people are interacting and being influenced by, and how that then sort of plays out. Um, I think is a, is a really interesting uh, use of that. Um, so no, really good, fantastic, thank you. Uh, okay, next up, Atari ST. Hi, oh, yeah. Um, so um, we uh, chose not to go for a sensible subject related to our field at all um, because it wasn't specified in the uh, task and uh, we first discussed um, uh, how supermarkets might uh, model uh, shoppers during a uh, disaster uh, particularly regarding toilet paper um, and how we might solve the issue of having enough toilet paper for everyone or what to do um, should everyone panic buy um, then we changed our minds about that because it seemed quite complicated to try and, um, you know, um, limit it. To, be, whether, whether, do we go for supermarkets as a whole? Do we talk, go, talk about the um, supply chain or do we talk about a particular supermarket? Do we basically look at um, the influence of uh, your, yeah, your neighbourhood? What would that be? Because so I, is it about going to the, check out seeing somebody stack two trolleys full and then realizing that maybe they know something you don't and how that then carries on like the ideas um uh spread the way a disease does within an actual what single given supermarket maybe even testing that out by um having students to uh, get a layer uh, uh, uh find a, a baseline for uh, people um buying toilet paper on a given day and then going in there and getting somebody to push two trolleys full of toilet paper through the tills and see what the effect on that is for the rest of the day. Um, yes, we changed our minds completely and started talking about uh, what it, uh, we might need to do to uh, model uh, the um, overall demand of hot dogs at a barbecue. Um, so we'd have a grid that would represent a garden. It would be a 2D uh, model. Um, the states where we would basically just have uh, are uh, hungry or fed for the guests. Um, and basic rules of thumbs might be that, okay, I, I don't know if we want to talk about how long the barbecue would last, but let's say four hours. There are 20 guests. Uh, hot dogs come in packets of six, um, and guests would remain fed for 25 minutes after eating one hot dog. Uh, if you've got, say, two or more neighbors who are fed, i.e. have had a hot dog, then you become hungry. Um, either because you know, you're know uh, you seeing other people are eating and so that gives you permission and give yourself permission to eat more or um, um, uh, yeah, um, that's, your neighborhood would be the other guest. I don't know if that's a more neighborhood or not. And the answer that we want are, what is the overall hot dog demand? Uh, how many packets of hot dogs are optimally required for there to be as few as possible left over seeing as they come in packets of six and you've got the number of guests, 20. And do we need to pop out to the supermarket and get some more at the end of the day? Brilliant. No, I, I love these ideas. Um, I, I, I think the hot dog thing needs to become a project, uh, if only that I can co-author a paper about the optimization of hot dog supply at a barbecue uh, um, uh, using agent-based simulation, I think is is possibly uh, would be the peak of my career uh, in terms of modeling. Uh, fantastic, yeah, really, really interesting ideas. I, I love the uh, the toilet paper one as well. I think that's uh, you could actually. I mean, it's funny you said about supermarket. The, the, uh, one of the ideas I had as you were all sort of going on the task is um, looking at the dynamics of. Um, people walking around supermarkets and how that influences people you know you suddenly see people uh, uh crowding around a particular aisle of the supermarket and that then encourages people to say oh, what were they looking at you know well, there's some bargains down here and uh you know that 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 kind of thing can be uh really interesting again it goes back to that sort of uh, diffusion model but mixed with a um uh, a sort of uh, physical space element as well brilliant thank you very much uh okay uh, bbc micro
Hi, Dan. Um, I think I would speak for BBC Micro. Um, um, for, for us, we had like a, a little bit of, um, you know, um, issue trying to sort of just put everything together because it, it's, it's, it's quite abstract for us. Um, but we we're able to come up with something. I'll just quickly share my, my screen. I don't know, if, can you see my screen? Yeah, that's come through, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so what we went for is we, we decided to sort of just model um, sort of um, respiratory disease infection. So um, um, and just taking questions by question and just answering, you know, what, what, um, how we, we're going to approach that. So in terms of um, the dimensionality, um, we went for two dimensions because um, that, that better represented, you know, what we wanted. Um, in terms of how many states, uh, we, we, we decided to keep it simple because I think you mentioned something about, you know, um, with CA um, models, um, you, you can't really remember the previous generation. I might be wrong. Yeah, so um, it, was, it, it might be a bit difficult for us to model things like, you know, um, when a person gets um, um, sort of immune after a certain um, period of time. So we just went for something simple and just went for two states. Um, either a person is infectious or a person is not um, infected. Um, and then in terms of the neighborhood, um, we thought more was, was, was a better one for us um, um, in terms of you know, what we wanted to do. Um, um, so the rules we came up with is if um, a person is infected and that person will be able to infect sort of like um, uh, the neighbors, the surrounding neighbors and, and, and that. Um, and the questions, um, what, what sort of question we want to answer is just sort of, you know, just modeling that and see how, you know, um, you, know, inf uh, uh, you know, people can be infected and, and, and that sort of stuff. And um, um, in terms of, um, you know, um, the intervention, you know, that um, can be put in place, um, you know, just, just, you know, just to reduce, reduce the, the impact of, of, of the disease. So that's, that's what we came up with. Brilliant. So thank you. No, really, again, really interesting use uh, of that and a, a, a good um, uh, way in which you're, you're sort of representing your your neighbours as being, you know, sort of uh, um, a, a meaningful uh, uh, entity there in, in terms of thinking, you know, potential uh, um, uh, sort of aerosol spread of, uh, of disease. So I think that that's a, a really interesting one. You're right about the memory thing. So with the cellular automaton, you can't, but we'll see next week uh, how with a with a, a wider agent based simulation um you can and in fact you'll be able to create something very similar to what you just come up with there uh, and we will be doing that where um you know you will have uh, a, a period of time that you are infectious um uh, and, and you have that kind of memory state there brilliant thank you uh okay so last few commodore 64 up next hello i'll talk for our group so the scenario we looked at was drug dealing and turf wars between drug dealers with a view for police to understand the dynamics and try to disrupt these gangs. So thinking about a two dimensional grid, each square on our grid represented a discrete location. And the square was on if there was a drug dealer active and off if there wasn't. Sorry, I can't share my screen to uh, to talk talk it through. Um, and we use the more neighbourhood rules. Um, the rules we went for, not entirely sure if they were if they were right, but it gave us some interesting patterns. Um, so if a square is on, i.e. there's an active dealer, and the three or more squares around that are also on, that square would turn off. And if the square is off, and one or zero squares around is on, that square would turn on. And the principles we were working on were that squares that are on go off because of police activity and squares that are off go on because of demand and a lack of competition. Um, to develop the model further, we'd probably want to incorporate factors such as indices of multiple deprivation as well. Um, some of the questions we were hoping to address would be, can we predict system activity in three, six, 12 months. And if we can make those predictions, can we therefore predict escalations in violence and conflict and turf wars? And what this would hopefully enable us to do is um, to understand where we should put police resources and work proactively. Um, we'd hopefully have a 
be able to answer the question about how much drug dealing the system can accommodate. Um, and we could also maybe understand how disruption activity might lead to the displacement of crime into other locations. Um, and then in terms of interventions, we'd want to um, inform resource allocation by location. Um, we could look at modeling different sets of rules and looking at the different patterns that emerge. And then also kind of going one step further, looking at maybe where to place outreach services as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, again, really interesting. I think that 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 I could really see a role for uh, uh, Senator Thomason, um, uh, maybe even as is, but uh, certainly uh, within agent-based simulation more generally. Anyway, um, uh, to look at that that kind of thing, I think that's uh, exactly the kind of the question you'd want to ask of that kind of model. You know, where um, where should we best place our interventions um, uh, for that? So I think no, that that would be a a really interesting use, a really creative use, and potentially really impactful as well. I think that just looking at those kind of behavioural dynamics and how how that, that that spreads within the population, I think would be would be really interesting. Um, brilliant thank you no again very interesting uh ibm pc you've got someone from ibm pc anyone <laughs> okay Okay, maybe we haven't, we've lost IBM PC. Uh, so last up then, we've got uh, ZX Spectrum. Uh, do you want to present what, what you did? Yeah, so we decided to look at the outbreak of um, violence in protests. Again, not really <laughs> not really related to many of our areas of expertise, but um, we thought it'd be quite interesting to look at the behaviour. So I'll just share my screen, screen quickly. Um, so we kind of decided on having a 2D grid representing um, protesters in space. And then we thought about having these categories. So we had peaceful protesters, like disgruntled protesters and then enraged protesters. And also we thought about adding a police officer in. Um, it kind of complicated things a bit. So we, we sort of looked at both options. Um, we were thinking of using the more uh, square at least for the, the first three categories. So if you had, say, uh, three disgruntled people around you and you were a peaceful protester, you would become disgruntled. Um, these numbers, we would want to like play around with it to decide what, what would be more most representative and what, what would work. But um, these were kind of our first ideas. Um, if you had quite a few disgruntled people around you and you're also disgruntled, maybe you'd become enraged. Uh, and then to model kind of like violence being uh, brought back to a, to a peaceful protest. If you had more than two enraged people around you and you were enraged, you would become back to like a peaceful protester. And that's where we would kind of swap this rule out for a police officer. And this idea was then that if a police officer realized that there was violence breaking out in a region, then they could um, go there and kind of calm the situation down again. Um, and this would probably be useful for saying if you had a protest of a certain size, where would you want your police officers based and how many would you need? Um, and we also thought about having uh, different kind of grid makeup. So you could have like riot police at the front and maybe in some cases that would make violence more likely and in some cases it would make it less likely. And where, where maybe you'd want to contain a protest to make it less likely to become violent. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, yeah, that re really nice idea. I like that, and it's uh, uh, really creative. And I, 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 I really like how you thought about the um, the, the different ways in which uh, um, uh, the sort of states can emerge, and how you know you can have these this kind of fourth state that that uh, potentially changes things. As you say, it could could be either way. It could be the pl the police officer can then um, you know sort of uh, uh, um, uh, quash that, or it might be that. Um, if you've got, uh, just thinking off the top of my head, maybe so, uh, uh, if you've got a certain threshold and certain number of police officers within a space that then people f uh, feel threatened and then it then it then you get more people enraged. Um, yeah. so that's interplay then between, um, you know, uh, balancing the right number of police officers for for that kind of dynamic. I can imagine watching uh, that that evolve, and I think that would be uh, really interesting actually to, to to watch play out. 
Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so fantastic uh, ideas there that we've heard uh, from all of the groups. Uh, I'm going to uh, apologize for everyone. I'm going to hand over to uh, Elliot now um, uh, to share his thoughts and uh, declare a winner. Dan, can I ask? So that was, uh, that was oh. really, really difficult. Uh, some really great explanations. Um, but there only can be one winner. And as much as I loved the uh, the hot dog idea, so thanks, Jason, for um, uh, presenting that. I think the final one's at X Spectrum. I think, you know, for the, for the relevance, the explanation uh, and the visuals, you know, the, the whole package, I think, the, yeah, that's my favourite. But well done, everyone, uh, for, for giving it some thought. Uh, it is a, a new concept for a lot of us. Uh, and so it did require a bit of a different way of thinking. So, uh, yeah, some great ideas. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Elliot. And well done to, um, to ZX Spectrum. Um, again, yeah, fantastic ideas uh, from all of you. I could see quite a few of those actually uh, becoming with uh, projects if you wanted to pursue uh, some of that. And hopefully with the stuff that you'll learn next week as well, um, where you're not so constrained with this stuff, that um, actually uh, you'll have another go to uh, be a bit creative. But also uh, the beauty of what you'll do next week is you'll have a chance to get hands on with a practical agent based model. Um, then come up with a design um, and then actually build it as well um, using using the Mesa package. So um, hopefully that will, that will uh, and it might, might be that you expand on something you've done today or come up with a, a new idea based on the stuff we go through um, next week. So there was a, a handoff. I think, uh, Tim, sorry, you, you were trying to come in there. Yeah, sorry, just a quick question. With, with all of this uh, agent-based simulation, and we've had a few examples of uh, kind of like staff well-being, and if you were, like just a crude example, perhaps if you were to, increased pay or like free parking these inter if you model these factors and you say yeah hypothetically you would predict that that would be a pull or a push factor how do you it's probably a limit of how well i can think in an abstract way but you know for example i think you mentioned right at the beginning with the bumblebees you then went out to the field and like mapped the bumblebees so how do you kind of correlate where you might conceive those factors to be and what they really are does that make does yeah. that make sense? yes it does so so um it is slightly different, obviously, with, with something like an agent-based simulation, um, it is a bit more abstract. So, uh, you know, with something like a, a discrete event simulation, you can say, well, OK, I've built my model. We've plugged in these queuing times um, and uh, we've done a bit of black box validation. And, yeah, it looks about right. Uh, and these bits of the model, if I look at just that bit, the triage bit, that that seems to represent what's happening uh, in reality. So uh, we're we're building confidence that you know it's it's a kind of representation. With it's a bit different with um, an agent based simulation. It depends what you're doing, um, but um, you may have a situation where it's quite abstract, and so you're saying, well, look, we're basically saying that if you've got this kind of influence of rules, the kind of dynamics you would expect to see emerge are, are this. And so that you don't tend to use these models as, I mean, not that we use discrete, we should use discrete event simulations generally as accurate predictors, but they're, they're, um, it's, that's even more the case with something like an agent-based simulation. You're just trying to get a feel for what the what the kind of emergent dynamics might look like and how that might sort of change thinking and think about okay so what 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 do we need to do about that it helps people explore and think through things um so uh, i mean you know a good example that that last one from zx spectrum with the um you know uh, in terms of protests and and how you might uh, locate police officers that that might give you it's not saying you wouldn't expect that model to say well look if we place three police officers in that location we think that the uh we predict there will be a riot um what we're saying is that um uh there's a complex interplay happening um and that we need to be careful about how we balance our police officer force across uh, uh the, the the protest because um, things can erupt if uh, this kind of thing happens and, and things can spiral out of control. So we're, we're watching these kind of behavioural dynamics emerge um, if certain things happen. Um, so it, it's it's much more about um, uh, uh, kind of getting those sort of behavioural dynamics, understanding what that might look like than trying to say you should put in another nurse uh, or something like yeah. that. So that makes sense so but it's quite it's quite dependent on, on you as the modeler what you kind of how you've how you've kind of made those assumptions and rules like anything I suppose. yeah yeah absolutely i mean so the you know uh with i mean obviously with the b thing that we we uh i mean we we're taking aback really about how, how close it was but um it wasn't necessarily we, we were looking at um the you know how how long do and we're not trying to you know compare 
okay, real bees spent about an average of three minutes on this patch of uh, plants um, versus our model, which predicted that it's saying what what's the level of movement? What, how much movement are we getting? Where are people? How are they distributing themselves? Are we seeing the same kind of patterns emerge? Um, so it's more that kind of uh, that kind of validation and how that that would be used. So it is, yeah, it it is a slightly different way of thinking, but of course it's a different problem. So if you're modeling a behavioral system you you've got a uh, a behavioral problem that you are uh presumably trying to tackle and to come up with an intervention so it kind of guides the thinking for that um for that intervention really how how might we best intervene um and how might these things sort of play out if we were to try different things okay that's really helpful thanks no worries. Okay, uh, let's leave there. Because apologies, we've uh, we've overrun, but it was uh, delightful seeing all these uh, fantastic ideas. So uh, next week will be the last training day before our extended uh, Christmas break. Um, so we're going to spend all day on agent-based simulation, um, and I'm going to show you the fantastic uh, Python package Mesa, uh, which is a really nice package for um, building these things um uh for building agent-based simulations in general you can also use them for uh cellular automata as well although there are also dedicated packages you can use if you just were uh interested in that um but mesa is a really nice package it's got really nice visualization capabilities um, and it's actually really easy to use um it just uses the principles of object-oriented programming um, and it's actually a really nice way to cement object-oriented programming in your head because it makes sense uh, uh, and it's usually the point at which people finally get object-oriented programming because uh, it, uh, as I say, you've got this idea that you have classes that represent your agents um, and they have attributes about them and they have um, methods, things they can do uh, quite literally in the environment and interact with each other, etc. So that, it's actually a really nice fit um, uh, uh, to, to look at. In fact, um, uh, uh, it's quite a nice way to teach object-oriented programming is via agent-based simulation. So that'll be next week. Um, in the meantime, uh, as I say, we will get this uh, video up uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, uh, have a look through uh, the notes. Keep thinking about ideas. Remember, uh, over uh, the next couple of months, you're going to be thinking about project ideas. If if you've got ideas about behavioural stuff, some of the stuff I saw this afternoon would be perfect, I think. Um, but have a think about uh, this week and next week, whether there are uh, potential behavioural modelling problems uh, that this kind of uh, this kind of approach uh, could could help with. Brilliant. OK, we will stop there and I look forward to seeing you all uh, next week. Cheers, everyone. Bye bye.